There was a savage wasteland filled with majestic and fantastic beasts. The boundless night sky was always filled with the echoes of intense and fierce clashes. In a desolate part of the wasteland was a rampaging beast. It had a scaly hide, a trunk with enormous tusks, and a pair of long horns protruding from its head. It belonged to a species known as the dragon-horned elephant. A colossal bird of prey appeared above it with a ferocious gleam in its eyes. It snapped its beak around the dragon-horned elephant and swiftly ascended into the night sky. Its feathers shone with an ethereal light as it soared. Suddenly, a gigantic eye appeared in the dark sky above it. The colossal bird was stunned by it and veered off its flight path. The massive eye belonged to a humanoid titan that towered thousands of feet above the ground. It had a metallic band around its head, and a single eyeball was centered on its forehead like a cyclops. The titan wielded an enormous cudgel in its right hand. It raised its foot and viciously stomped on the bird whose dinner was still in its beak. The heavy impact scattered a massive wave of debris containing trees and boulders. The titan continued its path through the wasteland until it noticed a faint emerald glow on the mountain range below. A willow tree produced the light and gave the titan a peculiar feeling. It paused for a moment before walking away into the night. The sun rose over the mountain range and shone over a small human settlement with a wilted willow tree at its center. This settlement was known as Stone Village. Every day the village children gathered before the willow tree and were guided in the ways of cultivation by the village chief. One child addressed him as Grandpa Chief and complained about learning the mysterious characters before them. The village chief taught the characters known as Bone Scripture because they would be important for the children's cultivation. However, the children struggled to memorize them. The child argued that learning the characters was not as useful as the archery he learned from his dad. The chief retorted, saying the kids did not understand how rare and valuable the Bone Scripture was. He explained that if they could learn the hidden techniques from the text properly, it would be difficult to say just how much stronger they would be than their fathers. Another child raised his hand and asked Grandpa Chief for a demonstration of the power of the bone scripture. The chief complied and pointed at the large, dark cauldron. This kind of cauldron was used to refine medicine in the village. Its great size and mass made it immovable to the children during training. Only a few adults within Stone Village could lift the cauldron. Grandpa Chief called a toddler to come forward. The other children wondered what the chief was up to because the child in question was the smallest in the village. Grandpa Chief pointed to the large cauldron and asked the little guy to lift it. One of the kids said it was impossible, considering how much larger the cauldron was than the little guy's body. While the other kids continued to express their skepticism, the little guy clenched his fists in anticipation. The strength in his body gathered in his palms and appeared like strange wisps of energy. He placed his palms against the base of the cauldron and gently raised it from the ground. The entire class was flabbergasted. The kids wondered whether that was truly the power of the mysterious bone scripture. It was incredibly powerful. The little guy set down the cauldron. He let out a sigh of relief, saying it was so tiring. The little guy had long crimson hair and green eyes. His name was Sher Hao, and he was three and a half years old. Grandpa Chief sighed as he remembered when the little guy was brought to Stone Village. He was still a weak milk-drinking baby. In the blink of an eye, he had already become a three-and-a-half-year-old child still drinking milk. Sherhau's strength caused a clamor among the children and changed their attitudes toward learning. Every child was eager to comprehend the bone scripture and utilize its mysterious techniques. On the side, little Sherhau smiled brightly and enjoyed drinking from the gourd of beast milk in his hand. While the other children argued about why he still drank milk despite his age, a rumbling sound was heard in the distance. The Stone Village hunting party had returned, and Grandpa Chief pointed out that there seemed to be a great bounty this time. A child expressed surprise that the hunting party had returned early, despite not having left for long. As the hunting party approached, the carcass of the dragon-horned elephant became visible. It had been strapped and carted along. The hunting party's leader explained that they had encountered many dying beasts as soon as they left the village. He and his men discovered that even a vicious beast like the dragon-horned elephant had been trampled to death in the wasteland. Normally, the hunting party would avoid such a beast. However, on that day, they could not let such an opportunity slip away. The stone villagers could eat elephant meat for a change. Grandpa Chief said there had been much movement in the past few days and asked whether something had happened outside. The headhunter speculated that something incredible could have appeared within the mountain range. Grandpa Chief wondered whether an archaic descendant had caused the chaos because of the enormous footprints discovered in the surrounding area. He had a grim expression and said the stone village was probably in danger. Because of this, 
they would need to offer their prayers wholeheartedly to the village's guardian spirit, the Willow Tree, also referred to by the villagers as the Willow Deity. The little guy innocently asked Grandpa Chief to explain why the Willow Deity Grandpa never ate their offerings. The village chief chided him for his ignorance and explained that as long as their hearts were devoted, the guardian spirit would protect them. The willow tree was reflected in little Sher Howe's eyes, and he finally realized that it was no surprise that he could always feel such deep intimacy from the willow tree. It was as if he was held in his grandpa's arms. As the little guy's thoughts wandered, he subconsciously hugged the willow tree's trunk. In response, the village chief asked Sher Howe to get down from there because he believed that the little guy's actions were disrespectful to the divine being. One day, this willow tree suddenly appeared in the sky above Stone Village ten years ago. Grandpa Chief witnessed the terrifying scene of its descent from the heavens. The tree had resisted a lightning calamity around it before overcoming it and taking root within the village in its current wilted state. A voice called to the village chief and brought him back from his memories of the past. The voice belonged to a man who appeared out of breath and struggled to speak. A moment later, he regained his composure and informed the chief that something terrible had happened. The members of the village's mountain guards had been gravely injured. A devastating and heart-wrenching scene appeared before little Sher Howe's eyes. A child wailed bitterly and shook his father's injured body. His name was Pihu, and his father had been fatally injured by the arrow still lodged in his chest. Sher Howe knew the man. He was like an uncle to him, and had picked some berries for the little guy the previous day. Pihu's father always treated little Sher Howe like his own child. The little guy had never seen his friend so heartbroken, and he clenched his fists in rage. The mountain guard casualties had been the victims of an ambush by the Wolf Village. Those dog-worshipping savages had taken advantage of the absence of the Stone Village's hunting party and stole all their prey. The warriors' expressions turned grim because of the intolerable actions of their rival village. The captain of the hunting party rallied his comrades to his side, and they all vowed to risk their lives for revenge. Amid the clamor, the milk baby, Sher Howe, thrust his left arm out to the side, and an enormous green-scaled eagle appeared and hovered above the crowd. Its vast wingspan temporarily obscured the sun, and it had a ferocious gleam in its eyes. The eagle's large talons spread out as it gently and gracefully perched on the milk baby's arm. Everyone present at the scene was rendered speechless, including the village warriors. The milk baby's childish expression had turned into a scowl. His bright green eyes now bore lethal intent and shone with fighting spirit. His heart was filled with rage, and he declared his intention to join the fight against the Wolf Village. He would also play his part in protecting Stone Village and avenging his uncles. Despite the hunting party captain's efforts to protest the idea, the little guy had already mounted the back of the green-scaled eagle and swiftly soared into the boundless sky. The Wolf Village would surely feel the little guy's fury. As the crowd watched the milk baby's valiant charge, someone asked the village chief why he did not prohibit the boy's actions. This warrior was concerned that little Sher Howe would be in great danger if he joined the raiding party. Grandpa Chief said with a serious tone that although the great wasteland was inherently dangerous, this was an opportunity for the little guy to refine his skills alongside other fighters of the Stone Village. The hunting party quickly prepared for their departure and rallied behind their leader. The captain had called for the Avengers to assemble and led them in pursuit of their enemy. The milk baby already had a head start on them, and they did not want him to get there before they did. It would be bad if the little guy started the boss raid alone. It was also fortunate that the Wolf Village's territory did not have other green-scaled eagles. The raiding party soon arrived on the outskirts of the Wolf Village, where they immediately discovered their stolen prey. The headhunter bellowed loudly, demanding the enemy to surrender the stolen loot immediately. The man was the valiant captain of the hunting party and Stone Village's strongest man. His name was Sherling Hu. There was a sudden rumbling noise, and the bright gleam shot swiftly toward the captain's head. Its speed was so frightening that the captain barely had enough time to react. It was an enemy arrow with a long and thick shaft. The captain's speed was barely enough for a dodge. The arrow sailed past the side of his head and left a small cut on his cheek. It then pierced the tree trunk behind the captain and the boulder behind. The piercing power of the arrow made the tree trunk and boulder seem like they were made of butter. The attack left a trail of destruction in its wake before getting lodged into the mountainside and dislodging a boulder. A chill went up the captain's spine, and he was rendered utterly speechless. A slender silhouette with long nails and silvery gray hair fired the arrow that had almost offed him. The deadly archer asked the captain what he meant by claiming ownership of the animal carcasses. 
In the Great Wasteland, the prey belonged to whoever killed it, not to mention the beast carcass he stood upon, and if he shot the entire hunting party to death, they, too, would only become his prey. The young man had fox-like ears, and his pupils were narrow slits. He was the Wolf Village's 14-year-old genius named Bayai Fung. In response, the captain taunted him. He asked the young archer what he could do besides launch sneak attacks. Sherling Hu dared the archer to approach the party if he had the guts. The captain said he would slap the archer's head off. As he spoke, a burly man drew an enormous bow. He was the Stone Village Hunting Party's vice captain and the village's best archer, Sher Fei Zhao. The arrow he aimed would have ordinarily passed for a spear elsewhere. His breath was steady as he stabilized his aim. Since it was a confrontation of archery, he would also give it a literal shot. He admitted that Bi Feng was truly talented for his age. However, the boy was too ruthless and arrogant. Shi Fei Zhao vowed to teach Bei Feng a lesson. As he spoke, a sharp glint appeared in his eye, and he released the arrow. His arrow swiftly approached its target, who remained motionless. Bei Feng only smiled faintly and released an arrow, which intercepted the incoming one mid-flight. His aim was deadly accurate, such that the two arrowheads collided and neutralized each other's momentum. Every warrior in the hunting party was stunned. Was their opponent actually on par with the vice captain? It had become abundantly clear just how strong the lad was. B.I. Feng arrogantly advised the raiding party to return to where they came from. He vowed to eliminate them if they dared to take another step forward. As he spoke, his reinforcements from the wolf village had arrived. The wolf warriors rallied around the young archer. A man who seemed to be their leader addressed Captain Sher Linghu. He said the wolf village was currently in urgent need of many beast carcasses. He then promised to reward the warriors of the stone village if they could let them have the loot. The captain retorted, accusing the wolf village of heavy-handedness and gravely injuring people from the stone village. The wolf village had snuck into the stone village's territory and stolen their prey. Shi Ling Hu asked the enemy leader how anyone could remain calm after such crimes were committed against them. Shi Ling Hu said they were all men of the Great Wasteland, and bloodshed was inevitable in conflict. He challenged every wolf warrior to a fight if they did not agree. The captain glared at his opponents and brandished his great sword before fiercely charging into battle. Suddenly, a small figure appeared at the center of the battleground, in between the two hostile forces. The small frame belonged to the milk baby. His appearance temporarily halted the battle charge for both sides. Everyone's attention was on their little guy. He said the wolf villagers were rascals and questioned why they had killed his uncle and other members of the stone village. Besides that, they had robbed the food that the stone village depended on. The stone village hunting party stood in place, wondering why the little guy had rushed forward alone. Bei Feng thought perhaps the stone village had run out of warriors so that a baby would be sent to his doom. Bei Feng sneered as he thought that since the little guy was in a hurry to reincarnate, he would send him along. He drew three arrows simultaneously and aimed at the milk baby as he thought this. The arrows flew swiftly and accurately toward their little guy. In response, the vice captain released an arrow to neutralize one of the tree arrows. The captain, Shi Ling Hu, also made a move to intervene. With a shout, he threw his great sword into the path of an arrow and successfully intercepted it. He intended to block the last two arrows. However, he could only get one. A single arrow remained unhindered as it flew toward its target. The milk baby's eyes suddenly widened, and some thumping and cracking noises were audible. The arrow seemed to impale his torso, and its momentum launched his tiny body into the distance. Everyone in the stone village's hunting party shouted, calling for little Sher Hao in horror. Their enemy was too ruthless. He could not even spare a three-year-old child. Earlier, the village chief admitted that he was concerned about Sher Hao's safety once the little guy decided to join the raid. However, he explained that Sher Hao was not as weak as people thought. After all, the years of cultivation and medicine baths made him stronger than ordinary children. Shi Hao grabbed the arrow shaft as a fierce light shone in his eyes. His fist crushed the arrow as he landed several dozen meters away from his original spot. It was as though nothing had happened. All those who witnessed the scene were shocked. Bei Feng wondered what was up with the milk baby before excitedly grinning when he realized the little guy had caught the arrow. Bei Feng aimed his bow and released several arrows simultaneously. He wondered how many the little guy could catch this time around. The incoming attack was a volley of arrows aimed accurately at Sher Hao. A warrior from Stone Village shouted for the little guy to be careful. In response to the attack, Sher Hao thrust his hand into the ground and quickly lifted a large rock to block the deadly arrows. His movements were seamless as he repeated the action as he retreated. A wolf village warrior was shocked by the milk baby's tactics and strength. 
Sher Hao took a valiant battle stance when the entire volley of arrows had been nullified. An orange light flickered on his forehead, and a circular radiance surrounded his left fist. The light on his forehead condensed into a mysterious glowing symbol. Sher Hao glared at his opponent and said his uncle was very nice, yet the enemy wanted to kill him. Before he completed his speech, Sher Hao hurled another boulder at the second wave of arrows. He used the same tactics to deal with the attack. Bei Feng gritted his teeth in frustration. He had never seen such a wild brat. He wondered whether the little guy was dead as he coughed because of the dust cloud created by their intense clash. While B.I. Feng was distracted, a tiny silhouette appeared near him within the dust cloud. This time, Sher Hao took the initiative to attack, having taken advantage of the dust cloud, which acted as the most convenient smokescreen. He launched toward his opponent with his right fist tightly clenched and ready to attack. This time, a bright blue symbol appeared on his forehead, and a circular blue radiance surrounded his right fist. He swung the fist with all his strength. Bei Feng realized a moment too late that he had been ambushed. It was too late for him to react, and the milk baby landed a magnificent punch on the dog-eared archer while calling him a big baddie. Bei Feng's body was blasted away by the great force of the milk baby's punch. He reeled backward in pain as he wondered what had just happened. He was shocked to see the blood that trickled out of his mouth. He wondered whether he was getting a beatdown from a three-year-old child. He was in deep denial. Not even the elders of the wolf village had hit him before. He was a genius, a prodigy born only once in a hundred years. This was not possible. The future of the wolf village was in his hands. He was a child of the heavens. In anger and disbelief, Bei Feng quickly regained his balance and counterattacked with his claws. The severing force of his attack injured his opponent. Sher Hao winced in pain and braced himself to endure the full brunt of the attack. Tiny cuts appeared along his short arms. Bei Feng's eyes glowed savagely with lethal intent, and his body hunched forward like a feral beast. A warrior from the wolf village noticed the change in the young prodigy and realized that Bei Feng had thrown away his bow. The man shouted in panic. That bow had been specially crafted to suppress the boy's wild nature and bloodthirst. Bei Feng was not as simple as other child prodigies. He grew up among wild wolves in the early years of his life. Therefore, he would become a wild beast once he lost control. Sher Hao lay on the ground a few meters away as his tiny frame trembled. The captain, along with other members of the Stone Village hunting party, shouted out of concern for him. He was still too young, and they had to do something to save him. Despite their intentions, they could not rescue him in time. As the milk baby weakly lay on the ground, he remembered the kindness of his friend Pihu. He immediately sharpened his focus once more. He also remembered how Pihu's father had generously shared some berries with him. Sher Hao also recalled the horrific sight of the kind uncle's injured body with the arrow lodged into his chest. The thought made Sher Hao clench his fists and slam them into the ground in rage. He gritted his teeth with determination. How could he just lay there trembling in fear? In an instant, he was back on his feet with sheer willpower. A faint brilliance appeared, and complex symbols glimmered along his left arm. His aura burst forth in waves, and more brilliant and complex characters surrounded his body and spread along the ground with him as the center. A bad guy was before him, and he had to win. At that thought, he summoned all the strength in his body and the power of his companions, Big Pang, Little Green, Violet Cloud, and Ant Green Scaled Eagle. He channeled the aura in his body to activate the innate skill he had learned from the family of Green Scaled Eagles that were very dear to him. The warriors of the wolf village could see a faint silhouette of a gigantic eagle behind the milk baby. Finally, the symbol of an eagle with an inverted crescent moon above its head and outstretched wings appeared on Sher Hao's forehead and left fist. The little guy had activated the primordial precious technique, and it was named the Moon of the Green Scaled Eagle. His body was soon brimming with power, and Sher Hao charged toward his opponent. He swung his glowing left fist, and simultaneously his opponent thrust his right hand, extending his deadly claws. Both parties to which the boys belonged were shocked by the incredible outburst of energy from the collision. The leader of the Wolf Village's party shouted a warning to Bei Feng, cautioning the boy against making contact with the glowing fists of Sher Hao. At the same time, the captain of the Stone Village hunting party, Sher Ling Hu, shouted a similar warning to the milk baby. He wanted Sher Hao to be careful in the collision. Bei Feng arrogantly stated that all was pointless because his claws could rip through anything. Sure enough, Bei Feng's powerful claws managed to split the aura of Sher Hao's fist. However, when they came into contact with the milk baby's fist, it was as if they had collided with a steel wall. They were instantly crushed. 
Bei Feng's expression twisted with horror and disbelief. He watched helplessly as the power from the milk baby's punch devastated his entire right arm. He could not believe the claws he prided in would be crushed so easily. Meanwhile, Sher Hao's momentum had not slowed down. After shattering Bei Feng's arm, his fist continued on its trajectory, smashed into the wolf boy, and sent him flying. He yelled at his opponent to vent his anger as he attacked. Bei Feng's body was launched into the air and crashed heavily by the feet of the Stone Village hunting party. Despite his short stature, Sher Hao stood over his defeated foe and called him a dog-eared bad guy before demanding that B.I. Feng listens to his warning. Sher Hao declared that in the future, B.I. Feng was not allowed to bully the milk baby's uncles anymore. A few meters away, the captain and vice-captain of the hunting party raised their hands as though to protest the idea that a three-year-old was standing up for them. However, the words could not escape their mouths. B.A. Feng stubbornly retorted. He vehemently expressed the denial in his heart. He could not comprehend that he had lost the fight and to a three-year-old brat, no less. To him, the loss to a brat was unacceptable. B.I. Feng was certain that the glowing light in the little guy's hand was undoubtedly a treasure. Before he could finish speaking, he suddenly felt the surge of a malicious aura followed by the sound of cracking knuckles. Everyone from the Stone Village's hunting party was ready to stomp his ass. What followed was a series of muffled groans and rapid pounding noises as the leader of the Wolf Village party helplessly tried to intervene. He politely addressed the enemy warriors as friends from the Stone Village and pleaded for them to show mercy and stop hitting the boy. A moment later, B.I. Fung's face had been turned into a swollen and bruised mess. Someone from the Stone Village blurted out a taunt at Bei Fung. The lad had shown himself to be arrogant and vicious. The man asked where all of Bei Fung's arrogance had gone. The milk baby told Uncle Captain their enemy had been turned into a pig's head from all the beating. At the same time, the Wolf Village party had admitted to their wrongdoing and promised to compensate the Stone Village for the loss they had caused them. However, what happened next was beyond anyone's expectations. The captain, Sher Ling Hu, sat on B.I. Feng's injured body, making the latter spit a mouthful of blood. Sher Ling Hu demanded that the Wolf Village hunting party leader cut the nonsense and asked how the compensation would be made. After all, it was a monumental event where the Wolf Village's 14-year-old genius had been beaten up by the Stone Village's little three-year-old prodigy. The Wolf Village party leader offered to apologize and proposed that his side would surrender the Stone Village's beast carcasses that had been stolen. In the background, Pi Hu was busy taking his mini revenge by stomping on B.I. Feng's legs. The captain, Sher Ling Hu, angrily retorted that the prey belonged to the Stone Village in the first place. He bluntly stated that if the Wolf Village wanted their young genius back, they would have to surrender the stolen prey and all the weapons they had on them at that moment. Only then would he consider releasing the boy. The Wolf Village party leader tried to protest, saying their weapons were akin to their lives. However, Captain Sherling Hu was in no mood to negotiate. His gaze turned vicious as he said there was no room for further discussion. He then asked for his knife with the intention of wasting the wolf brat. At that moment, the enemy leader no longer hesitated. He immediately conceded and agreed to the terms of the ransom proposed by Shi Ling Hu. Their weapons were a small price to pay if they could get the young genius back. The Stone Village hunting party members observed as their enemies surrendered their weapons, gradually forming a tiny hill. They were pleased with the unexpected boon. Sher Hao took a swig of beast milk from his gourd and smiled contentedly. The vice captain said it was all thanks to him that their encounter with the wolf village had not ended in a bloodbath. Moreover, Sher Hao had fought the enemy's deadliest fighter alone and won, effectively preventing casualties. Apart from the little guy, everyone from Stone Village was unscathed. Meanwhile, Captain Sher Ling Hu allowed the enemies to leave with their ace and warned them never to set foot in Stone Village's territory again. As the Wolf Village warriors' figures retreated into the distance, Bei Feng's pupils constricted into slits and his eyes shone with malice. His defeat marked a turning point in his mental state and cultivation. When the hunting party returned to the Stone Village, they thanked the Willow Deity for its protection. They had returned safely and with plenty of battle spoils. The injured Stone Village mountain guards had recovered too. As the villagers paid tribute to the Willow Deity, the village chief noticed the distinct sound of snoring behind him. The milk baby had fallen fast asleep. Someone angrily complained about the little guy asking how he could fall asleep while they worshipped the Willow Deity. He said the kid was always rude. Grandpa Chief's face twisted into an evil grin. He said the situation was perfect because it was time for the little guy to be taken to the medicine baths just as he was.
Sher Hao's ears twitched at the mention of the medicine baths. He was jolted awake, and the color drained out of his body. He was not the only one who dreaded the medicine baths. Along with him, some of the other kids nearby had fearful expressions. The adults, however, had strange smiles on their faces. Sher Hao turned and bolted away at top speed. He ran for dear life as the adults gave chase. As he fled, he almost swore he would not get into the medicine bath, even if they wasted him. He parkered onto the roof of a house and stuck out his tongue to taunt his grounded pursuers, now unable to follow him. Sher Hao did not, however, watch where he was going. His tiny frame slammed into what felt like an immovable object. Unfortunately, he was not an unstoppable force. This sturdy object turned out to be Grandpa Chief. The man had an irritated expression as he lifted the little guy by the scruff of his neck and asked what the brat intended to do now that he had been captured. This had not been the first time that the little guy had made a run for it. The milk baby helplessly flailed his arms and protested to his captor, saying he did not want to go because it hurt when he entered the medicine bath. Several large cauldrons were placed in a clearing within the village, and underneath each were small blazing fires. The medicine baths were made using the best blood essence of primordial beasts subdued within the wasteland. The baths helped the children strengthen their bones and muscles. Among the adults, someone commented that despite the precious marrow and blood essence used in the medicine baths, the little kids in the village only took it for granted. The milk baby tried to plead for mercy from Grandpa Chief as the ingredients were added to the cauldron. He said the medicine bath looked scary. Grandpa Chief asked him to stop blabbering and get into the bath. Meanwhile, the other kids were having a tough time. Their miserable expressions would make one think they were getting stewed by a hungry giant. The village chief added another powerful ingredient to Sher Hao's medicine bath. In response, another adult asked why he poured so much of it. It was clear that the milk baby had a special medicinal bath. Sher Yun Feng explained that Sher Hao had been in medicine baths since he was younger, and his tolerance was leagues above that of the other kids his age. When Sher Hao was dipped into the medicine bath, his wounds began healing rapidly. This was the miraculous effect of the special bath containing powerful beast blood essence. What many adults found amazing was that the little guy did not cry despite the intense and agonizing effects of the medicine bath. However, some of them who stood nearby expressed concern. They asked the chief to get a little guy out when there was a sudden eruption from his cauldron. Despite their apprehension, Sher Yun Feng insisted that the little guy endure it. He understood Sher Hao better than anyone else having raised the boy. Sher Hao's body had experienced unimaginable pain when he was younger. Therefore, he had to work even harder than anyone else. Meanwhile, the milk baby began feeling overwhelmed by the intense heat in the medicine bath. Grandpa Chief reluctantly watched and inwardly cheered for the little guy. He thought it was the only chance for Sher Hao to take back everything that belonged to him. The milk baby's body had been fully submerged under the surface. The heat suddenly turned to extreme cold. He felt his entire getting surrounded by an unfamiliar sensation causing him to feel disoriented and wonder where he was. Sher Hao drowned in his deepest and earliest memories in life. He saw the faint outline of a settlement and two vague silhouettes smiling at him and felt that the two indistinct figures were his parents. A feeling of deep anguish washed over him and filled his heart. The little guy did not want his mom and dad to leave him. The scene in his mind changed, and a dark figure appeared with a strange symbol in its eye. The stranger had an evil aura around them and seemed to have attacked the settlement in which Sher Hao's parents lived. The eye emitted a cold, dark radiance that seemed to draw everything in like a black hole. Sher Hao suddenly screamed for the figure to stop the calamity it had brought. In doing so, he sat up on his bed with tears streaming from his eyes and a panicked expression as he wondered whether the couple he saw in his memories were his birth parents. His memories caused his arms to tremble as he clutched his chest, where he had an X-shaped scar. The scar had a faint glow, and Sher Hao felt a searing, hot pain. The milk baby sobbed bitterly because of the tragic memory of his parents, which made him wonder about their present whereabouts. It was soon sunrise, and it seemed he hadn't stopped sobbing. Shi Hao left his room and went to look for Grandpa Chief. The man was his guardian, and had raised him since he arrived as a baby in the village. When the village chief heard the milk baby's faint sobs, he hurriedly approached the little guy and comforted him. Sher Yun Feng asked whether the little guy was crying because he was hungry. He quickly offered a serving of Sher Hao's favorite drink, beast milk. His coddling made even little Sher Hao feel awkward despite being a toddler. The little guy happily sipped from his refilled milk gourd a moment later. Two of his acquaintances from the cultivation class had scaled the wall at the village chief's residence. They watched Sher Hao enjoying the milk, 
and laughed at him for doing so despite his age. Grandpa Chief reprimanded them, saying they drank milk when they were younger. One mentioned that everyone was training in the courtyard that morning before asking Sher Hao to join them. The children in the class had made significant progress since the last time they trained. Their overall strength had improved. Besides Sher Hao, another student had successfully lifted the big black cauldron. The medicine bath was very effective. A boy with blonde hair set the giant cauldron down and smiled proudly. His name was Ermung. His smug attitude came from the confidence boost he experienced after matching the milk baby's feat of strength. Ermung had finally caught up. However, Sher Hao looked at him with innocent eyes and an inquisitive expression. He then approached the cauldron and lifted it with a single arm. While doing so, he explained that Grandpa Chief wanted him to try lifting it in that specific manner. He innocently commented about how light the cauldron seemed to be this time. His freakish strength left the other kids shocked. Some even complained that it wasn't fair, and others said they would give up. A heavyset boy lamented that he had been eating for nothing. In contrast, the little girl beside him sincerely admired Sher Hao. Suddenly, an enormous, lofty shadow engulfed the courtyard and obscured the sun. The children gazed at the sky and saw the magnificent silhouette of the green-scaled eagle. She had delivered fresh prey to the village as expected. However, it was not so in the past. Sher Hao was excited to see the large bird. She was his companion, Aunt Green-Scaled Eagle. Beside Sher Hao, three smaller birds happily dashed forward. Each was already a head taller than Sher Hao. They were Big Peng, Little Green, and Purple Cloud. The Green-Scaled Eagle was their mom. The three eaglets were like the Stone Village's little special agents. They rushed to greet their mom alongside Sher Hao. The Green-Scaled Eagle was the overlord of the sky in that territory. In the past, she glided across the wasteland at a frightening speed when she discovered that her nest had been infiltrated and her eggs had been stolen. Her wide wingspan tore down the trees in the forest wherever she glided in pursuit of the thieves. She finally arrived at a cliff and clawed at the mountainside to forcefully tear an opening to the cave network within with her formidable talons. As the debris scattered outside, the little thieves in the cave huddled in fear. The green-scaled eagle had cornered them after a wild chase. The children panicked and thought they were done for. Meanwhile, the eagle retracted her claw to expose the new cave opening. Among the little egg thieves was Sher Hao, who alone remained calm among his frightened comrades. The giant green-scaled eagle looked through the opening. However, the boys had hidden around the cave wall nearby. They tried their best not to make any sounds as they realized they had made a poor decision. They had gotten slightly greedy when they decided to steal some bird's eggs. If their situation remained unchanged, the angry bird would definitely tan their hides. The boys could only continue to ponder on what to do. Airmen came up with an idea and suggested that they use decoy tactics. One of them would act as the decoy to draw the bird beast away while everyone else escaped. However, the problem was that whoever would be chosen as the decoy would have difficulty surviving against their formidable opponent. Ermeng, who was known to be a little arrogant, said that if he were the decoy, he could probably stand a chance. However, the heavyset boy interjected and volunteered to be the decoy because he was the oldest in the group. Ultimately, the boys decided to confront the challenge head-on and began preparing themselves for the end game. They would have one final performance as a team and go out in a blaze of glory. Only the little guy remained calm. The boys suddenly realized that Sher Hao was no longer among them. He had quietly carried the three eggs toward the new cave opening overlooking the cliff, where the green-scaled eagle restlessly hovered. The milk baby proposed a deal with the bird. He offered to return the eggs to her, and she would let them leave and not make minced meat out of them. The eagle would have her eggies back, and they would walk away unscathed. The towering figure of the giant eagle was domineering. It would be strange if she let them go. Suddenly, the eagle paused and opened her beak at the edge of the cave opening. She would use her beak to take back the eggs. This alone was shocking to the other boys. No such deal had been struck in the history of the savage wastelands. Unsurprisingly, they could not believe the scene playing out right before their eyes. The green-scaled eagle seemed to possess the ability to understand the little guy's words. Sher Hao beamed joyfully when he realized his proposal had been accepted. He stretched out his little arms as he lifted the egg and tiptoed in an attempt to place the egg within the enormous beak. However, he was too short and could not quite reach the beak despite his best attempts. As he strained himself, his hand slipped, causing him to drop the egg onto the cave floor. The eagle's eyes shrunk in horror, and the other boys panicked. The egg landed on the ground, and a few cracks appeared on its surface. 
The milk baby smiled nervously and managed a weak apology. The eagle widened its beak in rage before lashing at the cave entrance. There was a forest below the cliff, and some warriors from Stone Village's hunting party charged toward the scene of the commotion. Their leader urged them to hurry because the children were inside that cave. He reminded everyone to do all that they could to save them. They activated the power of the village's ancestral treasures from a distance to get the giant beast's attention. Meanwhile, the tremors from the attack's impact in the cave pushed the boys back. They ran back through the cave passages and brought the eggs with them. Later, after the harrowing experience, Big Pang hatched from the cracked egg in the milk baby's hands. Big Pang saw Sher Hao's pure, innocent eyes and immediately bonded with the boy. There had been a bitter struggle with the green-scaled eagle after her eggs were taken into Stone Village. However, under the Willow Deity's protection, not only did the green-scaled eagle stop her rampage, but she chose to allow her children to grow up in Stone Village. She also became the village's second protector and benefactor. She was the overlord of the skies above the territory, but remained respectful toward the Willow Deity. In the present, Ermeng commented on the power of the village's guardian spirit while the green-scaled eagle suddenly raised her head alarmingly. It was as if she had sensed an ominous presence in the atmosphere. Sherhau noticed the sudden change in Ant Eagle's demeanor and wondered what could have caused it. There was something incredible within the depths of the mountain range, and it was unclear what its nature was. The village chief arrived at the courtyard. He had a shocked expression because of the powerful fluctuations he felt. The source of the tremor was an archaic descendant known as the Swan Ni. Legend had it that the dragon had nine sons. The fifth son was named Swan Ni, a true archaic and vicious beast. It was so ferocious that blood would flow like rivers wherever it went, leaving only misery in its wake. Grandpa Chief said the approaching archaic descendant was a beast like no other. It was a terrifying existence despite only being the descendant of the original Swan Ni. Beside Shi Yunfeng, the milk baby beamed joyfully and excitedly said they ought to bring the beast back and have it protect Stone Village's gate, just like the green-scaled eagle. Within the great wastelands, vicious beasts roamed about. Poisonous bugs hid everywhere from time to time, and hordes of beasts would surge forward, shaking heaven and earth. Occasionally, powerful creatures would contend for supremacy, wishing to match the heavens. However, the so-called heavens were not a realm that ant-like existences could touch. Even when the last bit of oil in the lamp was burnt and the arrow reached the end of its flight, the dignity of an archaic, vicious beast definitely would not waver. The milk baby gazed at the enormous totem pole in the distance and wondered whether it was the coffin of the great archaic beast. He thought the towering monument was super amazing. Someone in the crowd said it was expected that the great beast had chosen the valley as its final resting place at the end of its life. An opportunity of a lifetime had presented itself. If the people of Stone Village could obtain the carcass of the divine beast, they could have a treasure more valuable than any other. The mischievous boys were both nervous and excited. They wondered whether it was a good idea to follow alongside the adults. The enormous totem pole was considered the Great Swan Nee's gravestone, and the summit was covered with a unique imprint. Shi Hao excitedly said they should all go and take away the precious body of the divine beast, while his guardian, the village chief, asked him to stop in his tracks. The hunting party casually followed behind the milk baby in his excitement. The village chief made several futile attempts to prevent everyone from getting too close to the distant beast skirmish. Initially, they only agreed to observe the conflict from afar because the Great Valley was already full of corpses. Vicious beasts were fighting over the remains of the Swan Knee, and it was dangerous to approach the skirmish. Sure enough, the villages that were far off in the distance participated in the conflict. Each wanted to claim the precious prize and it was likely that the same allure also drew in the vicious beasts in the surrounding wastelands. If the fighters of Stone Village had rashly taken action, they would have already perished, just like the residents of the other villages, because the vicious beasts in the surrounding area had all come. What awaited was an incredibly bloody disaster. As Sherhao watched excitedly, the village chief suddenly ordered the protection and evacuation of the villagers. However, his warning came a moment too late. The boys were blasted off the side of the cliff and tumbled toward the earth below. At that moment, the village chief wondered what had happened to them. Sher Hao suddenly felt that he had landed on something solid. He was certain that he had fallen off the cliffside, but to his surprise, he now sat upon the head of an enormous primordial giraffe, and the beast appeared to be ancient, likely possessing a draconic bloodline. The giraffe turned its head in puzzlement. It had no idea that the milk baby sat on his head. The next moment, 
a hunting party member saw the little guy on the head of the giraffe. Everyone wondered how Sher Howe had ended up in such a position. Sher Howe, however, had a brilliant smile as he waved at his friends. He was excited to be on the giant giraffe's head. His excitement was short-lived because the giraffe had entered into a conflict with another beast. It turned its head sharply and threw the milk baby off. The captain, Shi Ling Hu, shouted out of concern for the boy. However, the milk baby waved his hands and maintained his brilliant smile. He was free-falling, yet there was no fear in his eyes. He quickly tumbled onto the ground and rolled into an upright position. He was completely unharmed, and it was clear that he never even needed a parachute to skydive. At that moment, the little guy realized how massive the world was as he gazed at the colossal beasts on the ground and in the air. His eyes and smile only looked brighter while he watched the beasts before him. His expression frustrated Captain Sherling Hu because he wondered why the boy would have such a yearning look at that moment. Grandpa Chief joined him in the attempt to caution the milk baby that he was in a truly dangerous situation. As Sher Yun Feng shouted the warning, the enormous claw of a beast almost crushed the little guy. It had been a close call. However, Sher Hao casually dodged to the left and then to the right. He appeared to have made a game out of avoiding the trampling of gigantic beasts. The claws stomped the ground ferociously, trying to crush him. However, Sher Hao managed to slip away and dove into the opening of a small cave. The captain and the vice captain of the hunting party sighed in relief. Sher Hao had finally entered a safer location. However, the village chief could not remain calm because he knew that that cave wasn't different from the outside. Sher Hao slid into the cave, surprised to find his friends, the ever mischievous band of marauders. One could swear that they were up to no good at a glance. The boys appeared frozen in place, and their faces were filled with anxiety. Then, the village chief panicked because the cave was a den of enormous wolves. The wolves approached the children and salivated at the prospect of devouring them. The milk baby was not scared, but found the situation rather awkward. He seemed to always save these little fellows from getting their hides tanned. A giant wolf bore its fangs and pounced on the brats huddling together on the cave floor. In the next moment, large chunks of rock debris flew from the side of the cave, effectively creating a larger opening. The boys charged out. They appeared almost heroic, having mounted and now rode on the head of the enormous wolf. The beast's head had a few swollen bumps. Its expression told everything. It had just lost a fight. It may have started it, but someone else ended it. Sher Howe urged the wolf to battle with the other beasts in the valley. The enormous wolf could only comply, albeit reluctantly. It continued the quick charge until its snout suddenly collided with an obstacle, making the boys wonder why they had stopped. They realized they had been surrounded by beasts far larger than the wolf at that moment. This time, they were certain that they were truly done for. The wolf struggled to suppress its whimpering. It may have been that if all dogs went to heaven, it would not be one of them. At that moment, an enormous green silhouette shot from the sky like a meteor. The green-scaled eagle had appeared just in the nick of time. Sherhau's ant eagle usually guarded the stone village. However, this time she had come to save the boys. She released a deafening screech that frightened the beasts as it landed at the center of the encirclement. The green-scaled eagle shielded the lads as they mounted onto her back. The milk baby swiftly taunted the beasts that once surrounded them as they scurried away. Even Ant Eagle found the behavior to be a little unbecoming of him. She flew the boys back to the stone village's cliffside lookout. Sher Howe later stood on the eagle's head with a blissfully oblivious expression. The vice captain asked if he was certain about the mission he had chosen to undertake. The man cautioned that although the green-scaled eagle was strong, many vicious beasts were stronger than her. Sher Howe had decided to go after the remains of the archaic descendant. The boy replied that there was no need to worry because he and Ant Eagle would be watching from above and would not face the beasts head on. With that, the duo of man and beast took off toward the totem pole. Grandpa Chief sighed with reluctance and hoped the little guy would return safely. Afterward, he led everyone from Stone Village back to safety because the open plains had become more chaotic and violent. As the villagers retreated, there was a violent clash of men and monsters in the distance. No matter how many humans there were in the great battle, they would all perish because humankind's might could not compare to that of beasts. Hordes of primordial beasts fought for the treasure that was the Swanese remains. If anyone, whether man or beast, could get the prize, they could ascend to a higher realm of power because they would have the opportunity to inherit the core of the innate techniques of the archaic descendant if they were lucky. The green-scaled eagle shot into the sky quickly and grabbed a savage beast by the tail before it could react. Ant Eagle made a beeline for the magnificent totem pole. 
She loosened her grip as she drew closer to the destination, and the captured beast savagely crashed into the ground. Ant Eagle had successfully intimidated the beasts on the ground and discouraged them from challenging her. The green-scaled eagle landed at the summit of the totem pole and spread her wings. Her gesture made her form appear majestic and domineering. Many primordial beasts surrounding the totem pole quivered in fear as the green-scaled eagle let out another deafening screech. The milk baby was impressed by his beastly friend's magnificent display. His eyes shone with excitement and a certain amount of playfulness. Sherhow suggested to Ant Eagle that they should forget about stealing the prize away for the moment. Sherhow noticed the beast's fear of Ant Eagle, so he let his guard down. Ant Eagle gave him such a profound feeling of security that he had so much fun. The feeling of flying in the sky was heavenly for the little guy, and he nagged Ant Eagle, saying he wanted to do it again. Ant Eagle was perplexed. Amid the frightening battle below, the milk baby was out to have a good time. It was already well known in Stone Village that the green-scaled eagle could understand the human language. She could comprehend the little guy's intentions and felt awkward because Sher How was oblivious to the situation. After all, he was still a three-year-old child and had yet to comprehend the horrors of war. None of it was a game. She, however, took a reluctant plunge from the summit of the totem pole as Sher How beamed with excitement. The feeling was truly exhilarating to him. He praised his avian friend, saying she was the best, and asked her to fly them up into the sky. Suddenly, the milk baby felt a chill run down his spine. His intuition sounded a sharp warning akin to blaring horns because of the impending danger. Shir Hao quickly turned his head, and his eyes gazed upon a purple serpentine beast hitching a ride on Ant Eagle's back. He could instantly recognize the creature before him. It was a snake with a scorpion's tail. At that moment, the milk baby realized that the green-scaled eagle had been flying too close to the ground. Before he could react, the snake bore its fangs and viciously bit into Ant Eagle's back. The snake's fangs penetrated the eagle's steel-like scales and sunk into her flesh. The attack put the green-scaled eagle in a world of pain, and she shrieked loudly. Sher Hao was enraged by the act of savagery and dashed along the eagle's back, clenching his fists. The serpent was a deadly foe that had to be eliminated. His right hand condensed a sphere of energy as he charged toward the enemy. He had learned the innate technique of the green-scaled eagle from training with Ant Eagle's little special agents. The technique was named Moon of the Green-Scaled Eagle, a mysterious bone scripture technique comprehended by Sher Hao. The snake charged at him as he thrust his palm forward and struck the snake's snout. However, the snake was too strong to be dealt with by such an attack. Its counterattack would likely be ferocious, so the little guy had no choice but to unleash a more devastating attack by activating the technique with both hands. The snake's fangs were instantly shattered, and its body was disintegrated. Sher Hao's hands trembled, and his expression revealed considerable anxiety. He had killed the snake. It was the first time he had ever taken a life, and he did not know what to do. He wondered what he should do and tried to imagine what Grandpa Chief would advise him to do if he were there with him. He remembered the counsel of his seniors, Captain Sherling Hu, and the vice captain of the Stone Village hunting party. Both men had once told him not to worry and that he needed to learn how to hunt in the wasteland. They explained that the law of the jungle governed the wastelands. Grandpa Chief also once advised him to be courageous so that he would become a man one day. The claws and fangs of vicious beasts encircled the little guy as he stood motionless on the back of the green-scaled eagle. Sher Hao took a moment to regain his wits, then he clenched his fists, and his eyes showed determination. He had gained greater comprehension of the green-scaled eagle's innate technique. His palms emitted a brilliant glow and a unique and mysterious energy gathered. He activated a new technique, which he named Empty Moon. Ant Eagle activated a similar technique through her wide-open beak. At that moment, she resembled a dragon preparing a terrifying breath attack. The beasts on the ground trembled slightly. They looked astonished as the waves of bright blue aura spread out with the dynamic battle duo at the center. The blast's impact spread like torrential waves throughout the surroundings and scattered debris in all directions. The milk baby and the green-scaled eagle charged into battle and began slaughtering every ferocious beast unfortunate enough to cross their path. As Sher Hao fought, he shouted at the top of his lungs that he would become a real man. After some time, the base of the totem pole had been cleared. The victorious green-scaled eagle flapped her wings and released a massive attack. It was a gust of wind so fierce that it broke a chunk off the tough base of the totem pole. Sherhau said that if they broke the rocks, they would be able to see the treasure buried underneath. 
The vicious wind attack of Anti-Eagle managed to damage the base of the totem pole and reveal the seemingly lifeless claw of the legendary Archaic Descendant. The Milk Baby cheered excitedly because the treasure was finally within reach. At that moment, the green-scaled eagle's sharp eyes suddenly narrowed. Her strong instinct prompted her to react swiftly to the situation. She shot away from the spot like a cannonball. Once there was a sufficient distance from the looming danger, she landed on a distant cliff. The sudden retreat left the milk baby puzzled and slightly disoriented. When Sher Howe began wondering what had caused his tough aunt's sudden withdrawal, he saw her frightened expression. Her body trembled somewhat out of fear. Sher Howe gazed into the distance, toward the base of the totem pole, and wondered whether the forest was on fire. On the other side of the ferocious horde, a flaming beast approached the totem pole, and it was known as a fire ox. It bellowed fiercely and attacked the totem pole, causing massive damage. A moment later, another enormous beast appeared in the sky. It was enshrouded by a billowing dense purple cloud that flashed with small purple lightning bolts. This beast slowly descended from the sky and landed on the summit of the coveted monument. It was known as the Demonic Ape, and its gigantic wings caused Sher Howe to experience the dread of a powerful opponent for the first time. At that moment, the Milk Baby realized that the green-skilled eagle had saved his life by retreating. Suddenly the totem pole shattered, and the head of a ferocious beast shot through the debris with a deafening roar. It was the Swan Knee, and its sudden emergence shocked the demonic ape and the fire ox. Sure how, too, was shocked to discover that the archaic beast descendant had only been playing possum. Its goal had been to ambush those two beasts. The Swan Knee charged out of its hiding place and activated a mysterious technique. A large, circular radiance appeared, forming from numerous symbols, and more mysterious symbols glowed around its body. In an instant, Suan Ni's enormous figure flashed past its opponents, the fire ox and the demonic ape. The unsuspecting victims were dismembered before they knew what hit them. The right horn of the fire ox had been easily sliced off. At that moment, the demonic ape realized it had lost its entire left arm from the shoulder. The demonic ape had also sustained considerable damage on its left wing. The dismembered arm crashed on the ground hundreds of meters away, and the horn of the fire ox likewise crashed somewhere near the vantage point of the milk baby and the green-scaled eagle. The scattered debris made both brace themselves. The earth-shaking battle unfolding before them would hinder any movement in the vicinity. Who would have expected such intellect from these beasts? The developments were quite a sight, especially for little Sher Howe. The milk baby's mind worked quickly before a realization hit him, and his eyes suddenly brightened. Sher Howe pointed to the distance and said to Auntie Eagle that although they might have lost the opportunity to claim the archaic descendant's carcass, another opportunity had presented itself to them because of the clash of the titans. As he spoke, his tiny finger pointed toward the giant horn of the fire ox. He told Aunt Eagle they should nab the horn and sneak away with it. The horn alone was an incomparable treasure. The green-scaled eagle shook her head. She was totally against the idea. Any of the beasts before her were strong enough to stuff her like a Thanksgiving turkey. Aunt Eagle could not exaggerate her reluctance toward Sher Howe's plan. In response, the milk baby wondered what there was to be afraid of. There wasn't much distance between their current position and the fire ox's severed horn. With Aunt Eagle's speed, they would be out of there before the beast even realized it. Sher Howe pleaded with the green-scaled eagle for her cooperation. He had almost gotten to the point of pouting like a sad baby. Aunt Eagle cared for him deeply, like he was one of her eaglets, so she could not bear to disappoint the little guy. She finally agreed to assist Sher Howe with his plan. The milk baby excitedly pumped his little fists into the air and said Aunt Eagle was the best. Sher Howe excitedly pointed toward the horn as they swiftly approached it from the sky. He expressed his unwillingness to return to Stone Village empty-handed. According to his plan, they would grab the fire ox's horn first. Suddenly, the sky darkened, sending the milk baby into a slight panic. The green-scaled eagle had just caught the horn between her claws when the fire ox turned its head and its fiery eyes glared at the battle duo. The duo realized that they had been spotted by the big flaming ox. Sher Howe flew into an uncontrollable panic while the green-scaled eagle flew away, pretending to be a random little bird that happened to pass by and attempt to perch on the horn. Finally, the fire ox turned its gaze toward its enemy and let out an angry roar as a column of flame rose from its body. The fire had risen into the sky and scorched the ground like magma. The demonic ape had been severely injured and was missing an arm. However, its wings morphed and enlarged into giant arms. The arms were akin to pillars when they landed on the ground and held up the demonic ape's body. Its new colossal right arm swung a right hook toward the Suan Ni, while the fire ox charged toward their common enemy. 
Both the demonic ape and the fire ox were going all out. However, their attacks only landed on Suan Ni's projected energy shield. While the three beasts prepared another round of attacks, each condensed their aura to the maximum. The archaic descendant, Suan Ni, forcefully inhaled and produced an incredible suction force. Despite their distance from the fight, the green-scaled eagle and the milk baby felt intense energy fluctuations. The Swan Ni reared on its hind legs and stomped heavily to release a devastating breath attack. From outer space, a bright flash appeared in that spot on the planet. The brilliance gathered and bloomed into a bright mushroom-like shape. The attack was strong enough to shake the earth and split the sky, like the serious punch from a certain invincible caped baldy. The magnitude of the breath attack was beyond mortal comprehension. Back in the battleground, the dust and debris had partially cleared, and the great archaic descendant, Suan Ni, was the only beast left standing in place. Sher Hao was shocked by the devastation he had witnessed. The big demonic ape and the fire ox were both in a miserable state. They had already begun running for their lives as though a sneeze from the Suan Ni would be enough to end them. The scale of the battle had surpassed the realm of mortals. Before Sher Hao and Aunt Eagle was the unrivaled power of the great Suan Ni. Once its opponent's silhouettes had retreated toward the horizon, it let out another deafening roar toward the sky as golden brilliance bloomed around its body and golden lightning flashed around its mane. Sher Hao admitted that because of the beast's intelligence and strength, they seemed out of luck this time. They could no longer claim their original prize as desired. Suddenly Suan Ni, that great archaic descendant, collapsed. It had entered a weakened state, and its eyes were gradually shutting. Even the brilliant ancient symbols around its body lost their luster, and their glow dimmed rapidly. When Sher Hao witnessed the sudden change, he was as giddy as a drunken man. He felt that his luck was amazing after all. He urged Ant Eagle to glide toward the fallen beast for a closer look. Once they arrived at the spot, Sher Hao used his unique methods to verify that the beast was truly dead. He used a twig to tickle the nostrils of the beast, then jumped onto its head and lifted an eyelid to reveal a lifeless eye. He then jumped close to the ear and loudly called to check if anyone was home. However, no answer came because no one was home. This was good news for the milk baby. He had finally confirmed that claiming the beast's body for Stone Village would be safe. The boy quickly turned to Auntie Eagle and asked her to help him carry the carcass back to the village. However, he was met with a ghastly scene. The green-scaled eagle appeared pale and sickly. Her breathing had become shallow and rapid. The little guy asked what was wrong when he suddenly noticed the injury Ant Eagle had sustained from the snake bite had begun festering. The milk baby realized that his friend had been poisoned. He knew they needed to neutralize the poison immediately, so he suggested they quickly return to Stone Village for emergency treatment. He said they would later return to claim their bounty. However, the green-scaled eagle insisted that she was all right and could carry back the loot. She slowly rose into the sky with the heavy cargo in tow. The green-scaled eagles were a strong species. Their claws could carry beasts many times larger and heavier than themselves. However, in Ant Eagle's case, she would not have struggled were she at peak health. While the milk baby sat on her head, he was impressed by her strength, but remained oblivious to her rapidly deteriorating health. Not until he noticed their low flight altitude did he realize how much worse the situation had become. The cargo weighed the green-scaled eagle down, and she struggled desperately to fly as far as she could. Finally, her stamina was completely depleted, and they all crashed on the ground. Ant Eagle could no longer move. Shi Hao had been thrown off her back and landed a few meters away. When he stood back up, he noticed that the wound on the eagle had worsened in the short period since he last checked. The little guy panicked and wondered what he should do. They had finally obtained the valuable treasure after much difficulty. However, the cost had been too great. Sher Hao unstopped his gourd and offered Ant Eagle to drink some of the beast milk he thoroughly enjoyed. He hoped that its contents would be helpful in alleviating the discomfort she experienced at the moment. The weak eagle lying before him looked a little pitiful. Sher Hao insisted that the eagle would feel better after drinking some of it. However, Ant Eagle was a little bit skeptical about the little guy's proposal. After all, great birds of prey such as herself did not drink milk. However, she complied. But soon, the little guy wondered why the milk did not seem to work as it usually did for him. All he ever had to do when he felt unwell was drink the milk, and he would recover quickly. The milk baby thought that perhaps the quantity of milk was insufficient. His attention was then drawn to the severed horn of the fire ox. He promptly left to fetch it and dragged it back to Ant Eagle's side. The little guy offered fresh blood that still dripped from the horn for Ant Eagle to drink. He then looked at his friend with great expectation, 
and asked how she felt after consuming the fire ox's blood. Ant Eagle communicated that she felt slightly better. The green-scaled eagle expressed her appreciation for Sherhao's effort by trying to help her feel better. Sherhao's face shone brightly, and he smiled in relief because he had found a temporary solution. The green-scaled eagle's eyes were always fierce. However, at that moment, she could only gaze at the milk baby with the gentleness of a mother. Meanwhile, Sherhao wondered whether Aunt Eagle was ready to fly again. He pondered for a moment before reconsidering her condition. He decided that it was better for her to rest first. He then went to examine the wound and ignorantly touched it. The flash of pain made the eagle yelp. Sherhao thought that since the blood from the horn had been so effective, it would be potent enough to heal the wound directly. He awkwardly tried to explain his assumption to Aunt Eagle. He also had a nervous smile because he realized that he had messed up by touching the festering wound. Auntie Eagle had been badly hurt, so the little guy suggested that if the pain got worse, she should consider yelling, and Grandpa Chief would come to the rescue once he heard the call. The milk baby expressed his unwillingness to leave Aunt Eagle alone and wounded in the forest because a bad guy would probably take advantage of her while he was away looking for help. Shirhao comforted the giant eagle and promised he would not leave her side. The green-scaled eagle was as dear to him as a real human ant. The touching moment was interrupted by the whistling sound of an incoming arrow. It sailed through the air at such a blinding speed that it caught Sher Howe off guard. The arrow shattered the little guy's milk gourd. The boy realized it was an iron arrow when he saw how firmly it was lodged into a rock several meters away. That sneak attack could only mean that he and Ant Eagle had been discovered by an unfriendly party. A few dozen familiar silhouettes appeared in the small clearing in the forest, and Sher Howe recognized them immediately. They were the warriors from the Wolf Village, the bitter enemies he had confronted a few days prior. He angrily reminded them about the promise they had made at that time. They promised not to trespass into Stone Village's territory. However, the Wolf Village's leader, B.I. Shan, stood before him. The burly man laughed and called Sher Hao a naive child. The little guy persisted with the reminder of the promise. However, Bei Shan's expression twisted into an evil sneer. The man stuck out his tongue and asked whether the promise was more valuable than the treasure that was the Swan Knee's remains and the Scarlet Horn beside the little guy. Sher Hao angrily shouted a warning to dissuade Bei Shan from attempting to rob the loot that rightfully belonged to Stone Village. Sher Hao reprimanded him, saying he should not have any funny ideas because he would not let the wolf warriors leave with anything. The precious loot was the sweet fruit of their labor for himself and the green-scaled eagle beside him. Sher Howe warned them against having weird ideas about Auntie Eagle because she was his family. Auntie Eagle weakly raised her head in agreement with the little guy's stance. It was all she could do at the moment to support him. Bei Shan laughed mockingly at the little guy for claiming to have a bond with the bird and referring to the beast as his family member. Bei Shan said even stupidity had its limits. In response, Sher Howe's expression darkened, and he yelled at the man, ordering him to shut up. He could no longer bear Bei Shan's insults toward Ant Eagle and was unwilling to let them slide. The man dismissed the little guy's protests and continued his taunts and mockery. He asked whether Shi Hao's parents were chickens because the eagle was the boy's aunt. Bei Shan then pointed out that the eagle could no longer raise her head. The milk baby retorted and said that although Auntie Eagle was an animal, she was a loyal and trustworthy companion and full of compassion. As though in response to his words, the warriors of the wolf village aimed their bows at the milk baby and fired. Sher Hao yelled and cursed at them for their malice and said they were worse than beasts. As he spoke, he unleashed the eagle moon technique and cut the iron arrows with his bare hands. Bei Shan sounded a warning for everyone from his side to be careful. The warriors assumed the brat was using a treasure tool, and it was the reason Bei Feng had lost to him when they fought. Sher Hao did not allow Bei Shan to finish speaking before he charged at his enemies. He condensed and released the technique he had learned, the green-scaled eagle's new moon boomerang. His attack quickly tore through the ranks of the wolf village warriors and left a trail of severe injuries before circling back to Sher Hao, who caught it. The wolf village warriors groaned in pain and realized they had been too careless while confronting the brat. They thought that the little guy was using a manipulation-type treasure tool, they understood that they could no longer afford to hold back because many had already been taken out and were down for the count. The successful attack emboldened Sher Hao to charge at the men who remained standing after his boomerang attack. B.A. Shan panicked and wondered why the wolf village's elder had yet to appear. As Sher Hao charged, an arrow struck the ground at his foot and stopped him in his tracks. The wolf warriors had launched yet another sneak attack at him. 
This time, more men appeared on the enemy's side as reinforcements. Among them was the Wolf Village's elder, who had brought even more warriors. They appeared behind the little guy and quickly encircled him. Bei Shan warned the elder about the little guy's abilities enhanced by a treasure tool. He reported that the treasure's ability had injured many of their warriors. The elder chuckled in response and looked at the boy with keen interest. He complimented Sher Hao for being young yet so capable. The elderly man was the chieftain of the wolf village, B.I. Li Chin. He sneered at the little guy and said Sher Hao would not be able to keep the ancient beast's carcass to himself because it was extremely valuable. The chieftain said he would give Sher Hao a chance to walk away if he was willing to hand over the remains of the archaic descendant. However, B.A. Shan protested the deal. He said the milk baby was quite a troublesome brat, and they ought to get rid of him while they still had the chance. Elder Bei Li Chin ignored him and motioned with his hand for the boy to run along. He explained that he favored little children. On the surface, it seemed that the chieftain was a sincere and benevolent man. However, he did not expect that his words would fall on deaf ears. Sher Hao stubbornly declined his offer and expressed his determination to stay. He declared he would never leave Auntie Eagle behind and would not share any of the treasures with the bad guys either. He accused his assailants of deploying underhanded methods to deal with him. They were using numbers to their advantage by ganging up on him. Shi Hao bluntly stated that he was not afraid of them. In his heart, the little guy wondered where Grandpa Chief was. He had quickly found himself in a precarious position, surrounded by enemies in all directions, with only himself to rely on. Moreover, the enemies of Stone Village were right at their doorstep. Sher Hao's words greatly displeased the chieftain, whose attention was drawn to the fierce bird of prey lying helplessly behind the little guy. Meanwhile, B.I. Shan ordered the wolf warriors to aim their bows at the milk baby. In response, Sher Hao quickly prepared himself to face the attack head on. There were so many enemies in front of him, and he had no choice but to fight. Elder Bei Li Chin suddenly interrupted the order, and his mouth widened into an evil grin. He ordered the wolf warriors to aim their bows at the wounded green-scaled eagle behind the little guy. The wolf warriors switched their target without hesitation. Sher Hao panicked at the thought that he would not make it in time. The chieftain instructed the warriors to aim at the exposed, festering wound on the eagle's back. The volley of arrows was released, and the milk baby dashed into its path with all his strength. He swiftly arrived at the spot between the incoming arrows and Ant Eagle's wound. Sher Hao stretched out his tiny arms to shield his helpless friend. Large drops of fresh blood fell on the ground a moment later. The evil chieftain clenched his fist in anger when he recalled the severe injuries sustained by the wolf village's genius, B.I. Fung. The lad was only fourteen years old and was brilliant. He was a true prodigy that was the hope of the wolf village, but he had been heavily injured by a sneak attack. B.I. Fung was the chieftain's grandson and had been gravely injured when he fought Sher Hao. B.A. Li Chin angrily shouted, accusing the milk baby of being a cheating brat. Shi Hao was in a sorry state. His left arm had been impaled by an arrow. However, he had managed to reduce the harm inflicted on Ant Eagle. Sher Hao had been immobilized, having his left arm pinned in place. At that time, the little guy heard a taunt from a familiar voice. The owner of the voice asked what the problem was and where Sher Hao's arrogance had gone. Wasn't he fearless? The voice mocked and dared Sher Hao to try blocking the next wave of arrows with his crippled arm. The wolf village leader, B.I. Shan, smiled contentedly. He was grateful for the elder's ingenious way of subduing a dangerous child without sustaining further casualties. B.I. Shan was initially convinced the chieftain would let the boy off the hook. The old man's face contorted with malice, and his eyes flashed with greed. His earlier display of sincerity and benevolence had only been an act. He had no intention of letting the boy walk away unscathed. The ancient beast's body, the scarlet horn of the fire ox and the demonic ape's severed arm belonged to him. He claimed all the treasures that Sher Hao had collected. The chieftain seemed momentarily consumed by greed because even he claimed custody of the little guy. Sher Hao's determination enabled him to deflect many arrows. Therefore, his enemies had no intention of letting him slip away. It was better to be safe than sorry. The chieftain ordered the warriors to prepare and fire another volley of arrows. He could not believe that a great bird of prey such as the green-scaled eagle could come under the command of Stone Village. He laughed and said, regretfully, that it was too bad the bird was beyond help. Sher Hao winced in pain as he helplessly called Auntie Eagle. He coughed slightly and struggled with the pain from his severe injury. 
The elder asked him not to worry because he intended to send the eagle to hell with the little guy so he would not feel lonely crossing River Styx. Sher Howe struggled to speak and choked a little on his tears which had begun streaming down his face uncontrollably. He could no longer contain his anger and despair. His bright eyes still had some fight left in them. However, Shi Hao could only sob and say his enemies were bad guys. The chieftain, Bei Li Qin, said the boy had a nice look in his eyes before ordering the warriors to release their arrows. The arrows swiftly flew toward their targets, making the milk baby shut his eyes and call to Auntie Eagle with great concern and an unwillingness to part. All hope seemed lost until a shattering noise was heard. It was the sound of metal clashing with metal. The milk baby's three friends, the little gang of marauders, had appeared beside him. They were not alone because the full fighting force of Stone Village accompanied their arrival. The combined might of the hunting party and the mountain guards was present. Sher Howe's eyes widened with surprise when he realized everyone from Stone Village had come to his rescue, including the three little green-scaled eaglets. However, the kind faces and gentle smiles he had grown accustomed to could no longer be seen. What remained were enraged expressions. Grandpa Chief and the vice captain of the hunting party silently gnashed their teeth with seething anger. Chief Sher Yunfeng angrily yelled at the Wolf Village's warriors for ganging up on a three-year-old child, despite being a bunch of grown men. Meanwhile, the little guy's friends checked his condition with great concern. Grandpa Chief expressed his displeasure at the fact that Wolf Village had broken the oath they had sworn. Sher Yunfeng vowed the Stone Village would grind them all to dust that day. As he spoke, the eyes of the warriors from the Stone Village erupted with fighting spirit. They were determined to avenge the little guy, and for the honor of Stone Village, they would fight. The heavy-set boy, Da Zhuang, huffed and puffed, trying his best to recover from the strain of running so fast and so far. He asked the milk baby whether he was all right before realizing that there had been an arrow that was lodged in his rear. Ermeng confidently told the little guy to take a break and leave the rest to him. Even the little eaglets chirped in support. The milk baby could rely on all of his friends to help him. Pihu offered his assistance in pulling the arrow out of the little guy's hand. The support and encouragement touched Sher Howe until the arrow was swiftly pulled out of his arm. The sudden burst of pain made him realize he had relaxed too soon. He winced in pain and cried out hoarsely for someone to save him. Pihu quickly apologized and stuck the arrow back into the arm. The feeling made Sher Howe wish he were dead. The little guy flailed all over the place as his friends looked at him helplessly. Luckily, Grandpa Chief appeared and asked the little rascals to stop goofing around. He comforted Sher Howe and said he had come to help. Chief Sher Yunfeng applied a special ointment to the milk baby's injured arm while infusing it with some of his internal energy. On the side, Sher Howe's friends took great pity on him as Grandpa Chief administered first aid to him. Grandpa Chief began treating the green-scaled eagle's wounds afterward. They were much worse. The chief said if they had arrived late on the scene, Ant Eagle would have been lost. Those savages from the wolf village even targeted her wound in her weakened state. He administered the treatment with great concentration while reprimanding the milk baby for getting rowdy and assuming his arm had completely healed. Sher Howe felt confident that he had fully recovered. However, his arm had been temporarily crippled. Sometime later, Chief Sher Yunfeng completed the emergency treatment of Aunt Eagle. He had done everything he could to stabilize her condition, and the rest was up to her. Afterward, he turned his attention back to the enemies from the Wolf Village. They were the masterminds of the tragedy that almost happened at that place. Sher Yunfeng ordered his warriors to punish the scum. The members of the Wolf Village were cunning and vicious people. They had bullied a small child and injured a helpless beast. Sher Yunfeng continued to declare they would destroy every one of them on that day. The Wolf Village's chieftain, Bei Li Qin, sweated profusely. He had grown slightly timid since Stone Village's fighting force arrived on the scene. However, he grew bold and declared that there was no longer a need to hesitate. The two villages would go to war to obtain the treasure at all costs. On the other hand, the warriors from Stone Village brandished their weapons for completely different reasons. Their priority was to avenge Little Sher Howe for the ruthless bullying he had endured. Suddenly, a faint yellow glint streaked across the forest and pierced several tree trunks. It flew with deadly precision and left a trail of devastation by targeting some stone warriors, leaving them with severe injuries. In the distance, a clawed hand controlled the tiny object, guiding its fluid movements. The yellow glint left a trail of bodies in its wake and pierced through a rock before rising into the sky. Its wielder drove it back to themselves.
To everyone's surprise, the figure controlling the object lay on a stretcher and was carried by two warriors. The Stone Village's warriors immediately recognized their assailant wielding a treasure tool. The weapon had an unusual appearance. It was made of over a dozen sharp, claw-like objects that glowed with a strange energy and revolved around the wielder's arm. The peculiar energy pulsated with mysterious glowing symbols. The attacker was none other than Bei Feng. The Stone Warriors had confirmed their suspicions. The lad undoubtedly wielded a treasure tool. Grandpa Chief yelled in frustration, saying the lad had been beaten to a pulp the last time he encountered Stone Village. He wondered how Bei Feng dared to appear before them again, after his life was spared in the previous conflict. Behind Grandpa Chief, Sher Hao realized the latest sneak attacker was the dog-eared baddie he had pummeled a few days earlier. The little guy was surprised that B.I. Feng was already back on the battlefield despite his bad shape. B.I. Feng's wounds had not yet healed. However, he shouted in rage, saying the wounds inflicted on him previously constantly reminded him to eliminate everyone from Stone Village. The Stone Warriors were instantly alarmed as multiple yellow glints flew toward them at the snap of B.I. Feng's fingers. The boy had begun a fresh round of attacks using the numerous sharp objects that made up the treasure tool. Treasure tools were mysterious in nature. They were made from the bones or body parts of primordial beasts. These tools typically retain the powers or special abilities of the original beast it was made from. They were so rare that entire tribes waged wars to obtain these tools. If the bone scriptures were activated, one could even borrow the powers of the original primordial beast. On their mission to save the little guy and his friends from the green-scaled eagle's nest, the stone village had used their ancestral treasure tool. However, the tool in B.I. Feng's hands was even more dangerous than that. The weapon tore through the stone warrior ranks. Their attempts at resistance proved to be as futile as bringing a knife to a gunfight. The stone warriors watched helplessly as the sharp objects rained down and peppered their bodies. The treasure tool was strong enough to shatter their durable iron blades. The attacks were too nimble for ordinary fighters to track with their eyes. For them, this treasure tool had become their worst nightmare. A single sharp object was sent toward the milk baby, Sher Hao. However, he blocked it with his right palm. At the same time, his expression showed his pure focus and formidable battle instinct. He was the first to stop the treasure tool's attack, and such a feat was exceedingly remarkable for his age. It was no wonder that he was considered the pride of the stone village. He angrily said the treasure tool was just like its wielder, who was sly and wily. The little guy realized that if he fought, the casualties would be greatly reduced. Because of this conclusion, he issued a challenge to B.I. Feng. Sher Hao goaded the wolf boy into a fight by calling him a wily old dog. B.I. Feng responded to the insult by slowly pulling himself up and exiting the stretcher. His body trembled slightly from the effort it took him to stand. Unlike the previous confrontation, B.I. Feng appeared mentally unhinged as mysterious pink symbols encircled his body, which was already covered with bandages. His unique treasure tool remained hovering around on his left arm. With a savage glare, Bei Feng said he had not come to fight but to kill everyone from Stone Village. The warriors of the Wolf Village noticed their young master was overexerting himself and expressed great concern for his condition. Bei Feng turned his attention to the milk baby and declared his intention to get even with the little guy. Right then, Sher Hao winced in pain while flexing his right palm. Grandpa Chief noticed the sudden change and realized the little guy had not managed to block the attack entirely. Bei Feng went on a rant, saying he had miscalculated during their previous clash and did not realize that the little guy carried a treasure tool when they fought. Otherwise, he never would have lost as miserably as he did. He continued explaining the extent to which he had suffered the past few days. The suffering had gone beyond physical pain. What was more unacceptable than that was his loss. However, things were different this time because the Wolf Village's guardian spirit had gifted him a treasure tool. Once Bei Feng finished his statement, he released the sharp objects again. This time, his only target was Sher Hao. The little guy had not let his guard down for even a moment. The numerous yellow streaks raced toward him as his opponent yelled in a manic tone, saying he would not lose to anyone. Sher Hao remained calm and motionless, while his gaze became steady with intense focus. With his right hand, he gathered the blue energy and made a circular sweeping motion. This simple movement deflected the incoming attacks away from his body. His skill and precision shocked the enemy warriors, whose mouths widened with disbelief. How could the little guy deflect the treasure tool using only his hand? It was impossible. They wondered how Sher Hao did it. The little guy made it look effortless, yet the treasure tool he faced was powerful enough to shatter stones. 
Sher Howe taunted his opponent once more by asking whether that was all he was capable of because he had used only one hand to nullify the attack. Every warrior from the Wolf Village mistakenly assumed that the brilliant glow in the little guy's right hand had been a treasure tool. However, once they looked closely, they realized that the boy held nothing in his hands. They also noticed several densely packed runes within the brilliance in his hand. The discovery frightened them, because they realized Sher Howe had been using treasure art. The Wolf Village chieftain, B.I. Li Chin, explained that the technique was a mystic art that even the greatest tribes in the wastelands lusted after. The elder openly expressed the shock in his heart. He wondered why the measly stone village would have such a magnificent treasure. Moreover, he asked why a three-year-old brat could learn to use the technique. Meanwhile, Bei Feng flicked his hand and summoned the treasure tool to his left arm. His eyes narrowed with the growing anxiety in his heart. Treasure art was also known as the treasure arts of the bones. It was a technique that could be learned by the human tribes by tracing and learning from the runes contained in the bones of powerful beasts. Ancient primordial beasts were able to pass on their unique racial arts to their descendants by carving them on their bones as runes. At the brink of death, these beasts tended to wipe out the runes to prevent the arts from landing in the hands of outsiders. Thus, treasure arts were extremely hard to come by. If one fully comprehended the profoundness of these runes, one could unleash the unrestrained might of the arts by activating the bone scriptures. After eons of research, even the human tribes had created their own treasure arts. However, these were mere imitations of the original because their prowess could never compare to the arts of the primordial beasts. Only those who were truly capable would be able to comprehend the profoundness of the runes and learn treasure arts. The Wolf Village chieftain inwardly concluded that the brat, Shi Hao, was too strong and should not be allowed to live. Moreover, Wolf Village must not lose to Stone Village. He ordered B.I. Shan to eliminate the milk baby when the opportunity presented itself. B.I. Shan received the order with a wicked grin. Back to the fight, B.I. Feng's arm trembled as he expressed disbelief that the little guy could fight against him, despite not possessing a treasure tool. B.I. Feng considered himself the proud son of the heavens. He explained to Sher Hao that his treasure tool was made using all 42 teeth of Wolf Village's guardian spirit, and since the guardian spirit was alive, the prowess of the treasure tool far exceeded the kind made from the bodies of deceased beasts. Grandpa Chief finally understood why the lad could wield the treasure tool without first comprehending the bone scriptures. Captain Shuri Ling Hu beside him said the situation was bad, and the treasure tool was bad news. It seemed that the odds were against Stone Village. Bei Feng continued with his rant and said that since the treasure tool was so powerful, he had never been able to use its full power. At that moment, he raised his left arm and shouted a word, Awaken! At the command, the treasure tool released a bright yellow radiance to signify greater activation of all 42 fangs. The weapon hat transformed into its final form as numerous golden symbols revolved around Bei Feng's body. He thrust his left palm forward and sent the 42 fangs toward Sher Hao. Each of them possessed incomparably greater energy than before. Meanwhile, Bei Shan hid in the bushes and drew his bow. He shot an arrow toward the milk baby as the village elder shouted for the boy to die for the sake of Wolf Village and Little Feng, his grandson. Bei Feng shouted that everyone stronger than he had to die. His conceited heart was revealed with that last shout by which he claimed to be the strongest genius. Bei Feng had unleashed a full onslaught with his treasure tool. Together with Bei Shan's arrow, they had created a pincer attack against Sher Hao. Before the little guy was the incoming attack from the treasure tool, and behind him was a swift arrow aimed at one of his vital points. The warriors of the stone village helplessly watched and cursed their enemies for their despicable methods. Sher Hao could neither advance nor retreat. The wolf village's treasure tool had an omnidirectional attack. He gritted his teeth with determination and opted for his last resort because there was no other way. He had one more trick up his sleeve, and the time had come to use it, so he quickly pulled the bandages off his injured left arm. Bei Feng sneered because he knew no one could escape his omnidirectional attack. At that moment, he was completely certain that he could finally take revenge on Sher Hao for the humiliating loss. Suddenly, a strange vision appeared before his eyes. There was a loud sound, and he seemed to be standing at the shore of a large water body. A full moon appeared. However, it hung unnaturally low as though it had risen into the sky from the water. A tiny figure stood on the water's surface with the moon behind him. Before Bei Feng stood Sher Hao with a heroic demeanor and a valiant expression. The little guy clenched his fist as he stood in place. 
He was unscathed, despite having been on the receiving end of the unrestrained power of B.I. Fung's treasure tool. The Wolf Village's treasure tool had been blown away, while B.I. Fung's left arm was still outstretched from controlling it. Having witnessed the peculiar scene, the lad wondered about the origin and identity of the milk baby. While the thought distracted him, Sher Hao's body vanished from the spot in an instant. Bei Ai Feng immediately realized he was in grave danger and summoned his treasure tool in response. The small components of the treasure tool returned to Bei Feng's arm as a tiny blur flitted toward him. The blur was Sher Hao moving at blinding speeds. His angry scowl was plastered on his face before commenting on how slow Bei Feng moved. He mocked the Wolf Village's genius by saying the latter was a loser coward who could only attack from afar. Sher Hao suddenly appeared before his opponent and leaped into the air with a battle cry, telling the wolf boy to taste his fist of fury. Bei Feng barely had a moment to react when a loud boom was heard while a powerful aura surged from the battleground. Sher Hao's punch had landed. However, the result was nothing like the little guy expected. Bei Feng coughed lightly and commented about the little guy's unbelievable strength. However, for B.I. Feng, the stronger his opponent was, the stronger his impulse to destroy them. As Bei Feng spoke, it was revealed that his treasure tool had blocked Sher Hao's punch and negated its power completely. He had used the treasure tool in defense for the first time. The milk baby was shocked by the strength of the treasure tool. The weapon was a versatile treasure capable of offense and defense. B.I. Feng grinned wickedly and flicked his finger downward, asking whether Sher Hao liked beehives. He used the treasure tool to rain heavy attacks from the sky above. The combination of the attacks increased the overall destructive power of the weapon. The situation did not look good for Sher Hao. This dog-eared baddie was more dangerous than he had ever been. The milk baby's left arm was still injured. He had even activated the runes carved in it, yet he had only been backed into a corner. B.I. Fung attacked relentlessly. He sent a torrential attack that made it difficult for the little guy to dodge. It was as if the 42 teeth had combined into one and increased the speed and prowess of the weapon considerably. Bei Ai Feng flicked his wrist and said with a bored expression that the little guy could run, but he could not hide. The attack suddenly changed direction in midair and chased after Sher Hao. It forced him to jump and perform an airborne split to dodge. However, this method of evasion had been anticipated by Bei Ai Feng. The lad sneered with a twisted sense of delight because he thought Sher Hao was a fool for attempting to dodge an attack while his body was still in midair. The milk baby grunted with frustration. He was cornered and had nowhere to run to. However, he still had a hand he could play. Sher Hao resorted to using the defensive technique he had learned. A familiar bright blue symbol appeared on his forehead once more. It was the symbol of a moon-crested eagle with outstretched wings. At that moment, a sphere of wind surrounded his body and deflected the incoming attack. The move was a legendary airbending technique capable of isolating the user from any external force. The wolf warriors were shocked to witness the technique in action again. B.I. Feng continued his relentless attacks and even used his right hand for greater control over his treasure tool. He could not believe his attacks could be easily dealt with. The treasure tool's powerful aura formed the giant wolf's dark gray silhouette. Bei Feng had a confident smile and said he would face Sher Hao head on. This form of the treasure tool radiated with an unbelievably destructive aura, recreating the likeness of the Wolf Village's guardian spirit. The onlookers from Stone Village urged Sher Hao to run as the spectral wolf bore down on him. Unexpectedly, the milk baby stood his ground. He tore away the remainder of the bandages as mysterious runes shone brightly along his left arm. Similar runes had already appeared on his right arm. He linked the energy from his forehead and both arms and focused their collective energy to release a powerful wave of energy with all his might. The full power of the treasure arts attack took the form of a green-scaled eagle that soared into the sky. As Sher Hao shouted with determination, the spectral shape of the green-scaled eagle shredded the giant gray wolf, effectively destroying the enemy's attack. The fangs of B.I. Fung's treasure tool scattered into the surrounding. Each was tainted with a suppressive green aura. While B.I. Fung was still flabbergasted, Sher Hao controlled the silhouette of the green-scaled eagle to crash into Bei Fung. The latter was shocked because his treasure tool seemed to have malfunctioned after the failed attack. Unfortunately for him, there was no time to lament. His final thoughts were those of disbelief. He was a genius. Yet how could he lose? The silhouette of the green-scaled eagle smashed into him and ferociously drove his body to the ground. A loud boom was heard because of the earth-shattering impact. Once the dust cleared, Bei Feng's motionless hand was revealed to be protruding from the crater. Bei Shan panicked and called the slain genius. 
He felt everything that had happened was impossible. Even the strongest form of the treasure tool had been defeated. B.I. Shan and the chieftain, Bei Li Qin, drowned in despair as they called Bei Feng. However, the genius was no more. The warriors from Stone Village cheered for Sher Hao as he valiantly declared that the world was enormous and that many were stronger than Bei Feng. With his final words to his defeated foe, Sher Hao asked Bei Feng to be a good dog in his next life, and right then, Bei Feng's left hand slumped lifelessly on the ground. The 42 fangs that formed the Wolf Village's treasure tool flew toward Sher Hao and auto-equipped themselves to his arm. As with all boss fights, taking the gear of one slain opponent was not strange. The treasure tool had changed loyalties after its master's defeat. Sher Hao examined his new weapon and beamed excitedly. His friends, the little band of marauders, were excited to have gained a new treasure tool and wanted to play with it. They celebrated alongside every member of the Stone Village on the battleground. This was yet another win for Stone Village. The wolf warriors began protesting the loss of the treasure tool while their elder coughed a mouthful of blood. He seemed to have lost his mind when he bellowed aloud, calling for the wolf village's guardian spirit to appear and salvage the situation. Bei Li Chin dropped to his knees and raised his hands, calling for Lord B.I. to appear. As he did so, his enemies from Stone Village prepared to attack. However, they were interrupted by the appearance of a pack of giant wolves from the forest. Their loud howls echoed in the area as Sher Hao contemplated the current situation. The wolves had terrifying gazes filled with intense bloodlust. It seemed that the cunning Lord B.I. had sent out some formidable scouts. The Stone Village's fighters found themselves surrounded by the wolves. Sher Hao stood next to his friends as they whimpered in despair. Among them, Pihu was the most terrified. He said with a shaky voice that there were so many big doggies. The Wolf Village's chieftain trembled excitedly when he said the wolves were the guardian spirit's answer to their prayers. The leader of the Wolf Village, B.I. Shan, took the lead and mounted the back of a giant wolf. He ordered his fellow warriors to join him, each mounting the backs of their giant wolves. Together, they formed the strongest fighting force of the Wolf Village, known as the Wolf Riders. B.I. Shan howled in excitement and urged his brothers in arms to attack. Grandpa Chief started to feel despair. He had never expected that the guardian spirit of the wolf village could summon these giant wolves. Captain Sherling Hu stood before the kids to shield them, while wolf riders taunted them from their mount's backs. They said that everyone from Stone Village was dead meat this time, and none would leave that forest alive. Sher Hao realized that it was useless to hide behind the adults because they had been surrounded at that moment. Therefore, he boldly stood his ground and clenched his tiny fists. The little guy's eyes showed all the determination a three-year-old boy could muster in that crisis. He was hit with a sudden realization as he glared at the giant wolf before him. Sher Hao seemed to recognize the beast. His bright green eyes widened when he was certain of it. The giant wolf had been the big doggy that had played with them earlier. The giant wolf was immediately flustered when he recognized Sher Hao. The milk baby's friends, too, could identify this doggo. It was obvious that the little guy made that bump on his head when they first met. The giant wolf felt slightly awkward that the kids he encountered earlier in the cave were now his opponent. Meanwhile, on the ground, Sher Hao and his friends waved their hands cheerfully while telling everyone from Stone Village that they were safe and that the giant wolf was a friend. The wolf warriors, on the other hand, were experiencing a major WTF moment. They were in disbelief. Before then was yet another situation they considered impossible. The giant wolves belonged to the wolf village. How could they be the playmates of the little brats? What happened next dispelled all their doubts and rendered every wolf warrior speechless. The giant wolf standing before Sher Hao lay on the ground and wagged his tail like a puppy while the kids called him a good boy. The wolf warriors helplessly watched from the sidelines and asked why the beast was barking, yet he was a wolf. Sher Hao cheerfully patted the wolf on the nose and called him a good boy before asking him to take his friends elsewhere and not to make trouble at that place. The villainous chieftain had seen his fill of the weirdness and shouted at the giant wolf. He addressed the beast, asking what he was doing and whether he had forgotten his pride as a warrior. Bei Li Chin ordered the wolf to kill the enemies and gnaw on their bones because that was the true way of life. The wolf's attitude changed once more. His eyes shone with bloodlust as he bore his fangs at the milk baby. Shi Hao remained calm. However, his expression turned cold. The sudden change caused the beast to stiffen. Shi Hao glared at the giant wolf and asked whether he wanted to be a bad boy. Shi Hao's aura had completely changed, and his eyes shone with a savage glow. In response, the giant wolf whimpered, 
lay on the ground and yielded. He wasn't alone because his pack had joined him. They all wanted to be good boys and girls. The warriors of the wolf village stared in disbelief. The little guy before them had beaten all the wolves into submission. To him, they were like overgrown puppies. The chieftain was both impressed and intimidated by the milk baby. The little guy had performed an extraordinary feat. In B.I. Li Chin's opinion, little Sher Hao was a naturally gifted beast tamer. In the distant mountain range, an earth-shaking rumble was heard, and a cloud of dust appeared from the base of the mountains. Grandpa Chief instantly recognized the unrhythmic tremors. The phenomenon only occurred when a stampeding horde of beasts appeared. As the name suggested, uncontrolled and concerted running described an act of mass impulse among different beasts. The stampede was unstoppable. Everything in its path was flattened. However, such an event did not happen naturally. Grandpa Chief concluded that something stronger than all of those beasts could have triggered the approaching stampede. As expected, a single beast flew at the forefront of the stampeding beast horde. It had the appearance of an old and wizened wolf. However, instead of front paws, it had a pair of wings. This creature was Wolf Village's guardian spirit, the Millennium Wolf. Shi Ling Hu cursed the guardian spirit when he realized it had secretly been preparing a stampede. It was no longer a mystery why it did not reveal itself earlier. A stone warrior expressed concern, saying that at the rate the stampede was moving, they would all perish, even the guys from the wolf village. The guardian spirit was truly insane. However, the wolf warriors did not share that sentiment. They cheered for their lord because they believed he was there to save them. At that moment, Grandpa Chief ordered Shi Ling Hu and Shi Hao to prepare the ancestral weapons they each wielded. The wolf riders eagerly rode their mounts alongside Lord Bay's stampeding army, intending to trample their enemies. The Millennium Wolf flew to the front of the charging stampede in an imposing manner. Shi Ling Hu stepped forward and said the ancestral weapon could only be activated in the most desperate moments because the great tribes would go to war to obtain it. Therefore, Stone Village needed to ensure it eliminated all its enemies so that the information would not be spread. Sherling Hu glared at the incoming beast tide and activated the ancestral weapon. A cluster of bright pulsating veins spread from his palm along the captain's arm. His aura elevated rapidly, causing the Wolf Village chieftain to exclaim in surprise. B.I. Li Chin did not expect Stone Village would have a treasure tool. The effect of the ancestral weapon's activation was the enlargement of the captain's frame. His body became that of a glowing giant. The sudden transformation caught the attention of the Millennium Wolf. On the other hand, the captain had bulging veins and rippling muscles as he charged an energy wave attack between his palm. There was a great silhouette of an ancient primordial beast behind him as Shi Ling Hu fired the energy blast toward the incoming beast tide. The Millennium Wolf was momentarily stunned when the captain unleashed the devastating attack. It was so overpowered that he obliterated the foremost ranks of the beast horde. Once the leading beasts were defeated, the rest were afraid to advance. The chieftain cursed bitterly. He could not believe that Stone Village had such a powerful treasure tool. The Milk Baby cheered because his uncle displayed great strength. However, despite the overwhelming power, the Millennium Wolf was unscathed. He hovered in the sky while his eyes glowed with dark crimson radiance. He taunted the human, saying that no matter how powerful an attack was, it was useless if it did not hit its intended target. Captain Ling Hu had begun showing obvious signs of stress. He struggled to withstand the enormous strain of using the ancestral weapon, and appeared out of breath. The Millennium Wolf mockingly asked whether Shi Ling Hu thought anyone could use a treasure tool. Grandpa Chief explained that activating a treasure tool required a profound understanding of the bone scriptures and vast stamina reserves. Shi Yun Feng found it commendable that the captain could use the ancestral weapon even once. That alone was a remarkable feat. He stated that the high requirements were also why the treasure tool could not be used recklessly. At that moment, Shi Ling Hu's body shrunk to its original size. It seemed that he had run out of stamina. He realized that the Millennium Wolf was a cunning beast. The beast was stalling for time. Shi Hao began whistling mischievously. He winked, and a sly grin spread across his face. In one fluid motion, he stretched out his left hand, wielding the treasure tool he had looted from his fight with Bei Feng. The boy intended to put on a show as he flaunted the treasure tool made using Lord Bei's teeth. The complaints and discontentment from the warriors of the wolf village only made the milk baby's taunts more elaborate. He taunted the millennium wolf, beckoning the creature to fetch his teeth if he could. Sherhao noticed that the beast tolerated insults well, even when the little guy called him an old doggy. Since that was the case, the little guy knew he had to turn things up a notch. 
He asked whether the Almighty Lord B.I. had no balls. Sher Hao referred to the origin of his war trophy and held his nose, saying it was no surprise that it smelled funny. He held a single fang by his fingertips as if disgusted. The little guy continued with his flurry of insults, calling the beast an old doggy who was cocky despite having lost his front legs. Someone behind Sher Hao said the beast had lived so long that his front legs had degenerated. He called the beast a coward, saying he should remain in the sky forever. Captain Ling Hu observed the beast momentarily and realized it was tolerating everything to wait for him to run out of stamina. Suddenly, the wolf shot from the sky like a meteor, his toothless mouth wide open. He completely avoided the captain and headed straight for Sher Hao. The milk baby, however, stood his ground and beckoned the old doggy to get closer because he knew he was not alone. A familiar towering silhouette emerged from behind the Millennium Wolf. The mysterious assailant was the green-scaled eagle. She fiercely bore her talons at the enemy. Grandpa Chief explained that Ant Eagle had almost died under the wolf warrior's attacks. However, she pushed through the odds using sheer willpower and some assistance from him. The wolf warriors wondered how the giant eagle had suddenly revived when she had been on the brink of death not long ago. While the eagle pressured the wolf, Captain Ling Hu dashed toward Sher Hao and launched the boy into the air, reminding him that everyone was counting on him. The Millennium Wolf had been surrounded on both sides. On one side was the green scale eagle. On the other, Sher Hao had gotten into position and began activating the ancestral weapon. Sher Hao shouted, saying the Millennium Wolf would not get away. The ancestral weapon on his chest glowed brilliantly as the green scaled eagle charged her most devastating attack in her present condition. Everyone from the stone village cheered Sher Hao on. Suddenly, mysterious ancient symbols appeared and formed circular patterns around the ancestral weapon on the milk baby's chest. His eyes were full of determination as he prepared to bring this battle to an end. Previously, when the stampede was approaching from the distance, Grandpa Chief had instructed Captain Ling Hu and a little guy to prepare themselves to use the ancestral weapons they possessed. The captain explained to Sher Hao that he had potential and the element of surprise because the enemy would never expect the little guy to have comprehended the bone scriptures at his tender age. Only those who had thoroughly understood the bone scriptures could bring out the true power of the ancestral weapon. Grandpa Chief explained to the little guy that the ancestral weapon was a treasure tool passed down in the village for generations, and with it, they could catch their enemies by surprise. After all, the enemies would never expect that there would be two ancestral weapons in Stone Village. The little guy felt how incredible the piece of beast hide was. Its profundity gave him the feeling that a universe was revolving inside it. He had started rejoicing that he had an ancestral treasure on his person, but he was quickly restrained by the two adults closest to him. They could not allow him to reveal their trump card prematurely. Once the little guy had calmed down, Grandpa Chief continued explaining their mission. Shi Ling Hu and Sher Hao were tasked with riling up the Millennium Wolf, which the little guy excelled at. Some of his highlights included referring to the beast as a handless freak and a toothless dog. On the other hand, the Millennium Wolf had used all his willpower to restrain himself to the point of trembling. Once he finally lost control and charged, Sher Hao and the green-scaled eagle cornered him in the sky when they simultaneously activated their attacks. The green-scaled eagle used her innate ability. At the same time, the milk baby activated the ancestral weapon and temporarily fused it with his body. When he unleashed the overwhelming power of the ancestral weapon, its energy took the form of a hellhound. However, their opponent, the Millennium Wolf, unleashed his energy-based attack to cancel out the pincer attack. The aftershock from the collision was tremendous. Captain Ling Hu thought the attack would have surely killed the old wolf. However, to his surprise, the beast flew out of the dust cloud, having sustained grave injuries. The warriors of Stone Village immediately cheered when the wounded beast retreated into the distance. They could grasp victory at last. However, Grandpa Chief reminded everyone not to let their guards down just because their enemy had been severely injured. He explained that cornered beasts were the most fearsome. As he spoke, the beasts that made up the stampeding horde turned their ruthless gazes on the wolf warriors beside them. The wolf village's warriors quickly realized that the beasts were no longer under the command of their guardian spirit. The consequences were devastating. Meanwhile, Chief Shur Yun Feng led the others to retreat. Some stone villagers carried the injured, and others transported the heavily contested treasures. The chief urged them to keep pace because they were not yet out of danger. Suddenly, a dark shadow glided past them from above. It shot from the sky and blocked their path back to safety. The beast took the initiative to speak for the first time and cursed at them. The Millennium Wolf had not yet conceded defeat. 
The hunting party's captain, Sherling Hu, was frustrated because they had almost made it to the safety of Stone Village's perimeter. The vice captain contemplated the state of things for a moment. Despite the heavy injuries, the beast had not yet given up. The milk baby understood the meaning of the words spoken by Grandpa Chief concerning cornered beasts. The Millennium Wolf bellowed and declared that none of them would make it back home. Then he charged an energy attack. Despite his exhausted state, Captain Ling Hu prepared to use the ancestral weapon once more. The best he could manage was to activate it only for an instant. The Milk Baby, too, tried to activate his ancestral weapon hastily. However, it seemed that their efforts were futile. The Millennium Wolf was quicker on the draw and released his innate skill. The silhouette of a giant golden claw appeared in the sky and shattered the ground below, blasting the stone warriors away. Despite his best attempts to brace the impact, the captain was blown away. Shi Hao was not spared either. He sustained grave injuries along with everyone present and spat mouthfuls of blood. The Millennium Wolf declared his intention to absorb both the remains of the Suan Ni and the Scarlet Horn of the Fire Ox. He explained that once he did so, not only would his wounds heal, he would even break through to a higher cultivation realm. At that moment, Shi Hao felt despair. Although he could no longer fight, there was still one he could rely on. He called out to Stone Village's guardian spirit, Grandpa Willow. Upon hearing the boy's call, the Millennium Wolf pondered about the guardian spirit of Stone Village, the Willow Deity. He spoke dismissively and ordered them to give up all resistance. While he laughed maniacally, the willow tree in the center of Stone Village moved the single vine that had any signs of containing life force. The vine gently swayed as the Millennium Wolf continued with his taunts. The latter referred to the Stone Village's guardian spirit as a bald and charred stump of a willow tree. He asked whether the people expected something like that to save them and whether they planned to kill him with laughter. Suddenly, a loud rumbling noise was heard, and the Millennium Wolf declared that every Stone Village warrior would die that day. Once he absorbed their treasures, he would become invincible. Pihu rushed to Shi Hao's side and helped him to his feet while whimpering and saying they were all doomed. The captain lowered his head as a feeling of defeat overcame him. He was certain his life would end on that day. The only one who seemed hopeful was the village chief, who shook his fist in denial. The Millennium Wolf continued his threats of destruction, claiming he would erase the entire stone village and its guardian spirit. He turned toward the village as he spoke. Before he could say another word, Grandpa Chief interrupted him. The man had suffered some severe injuries. However, despite that, he struggled and spoke boldly, saying the guardian spirit of Stone Village was not that simple. At that moment, the sharp glare of the Millennium Wolf gradually turned into a look of panic and then terror. His whole body trembled with fear when his eyes perceived the true appearance of the Willow Deity. The tree projected a majestic silhouette capable of supporting the heavens and towering over all existence. The Millennium Wolf started whimpering and sweated profusely. He faced the sheer might of the guardian spirit whom he had insulted. The village chief's words reached his ears. Shi Yunfeng's final words to the beast were that the true form of the Willow Deity was something beyond anyone's imagination. As Grandpa Chief spoke, the single vine of the willow tree swayed with intent. The Millennium Wolf could no longer withstand the imposing aura of the Willow Deity and shot into the sky, attempting to flee. However, the willow tree was not known as the willow deity for nothing. Its vine turned into a green streak of light that chased after the fleeing millennium wolf. The beast barely flew for a mile when he noticed the green streak rapidly closing on him. He knew that he needed to escape and was unwilling to die in such a place. However, his efforts bore no fruit. His retreat was doomed to fail because the willow deity was too fast. The green streak of light pierced through the beast's heart instantly and sent his body crashing to the ground. The extended vine was quickly retracted and seemed to have captured something from its victim's body. The wolf village's chieftain despaired as he called the slain guardian beast. The great millennium wolf had been slain, and the wolf warriors froze in disbelief. They did not know what else to do because their greatest benefactor had been eliminated before their eyes. The stone village warriors thanked the willow deity from their hearts. They saluted the willow deity and expressed their sincere gratitude for the protection. Shi Hao pumped his fists into the air and danced in celebration. Stone Village's guardian spirit was mighty. They could finally go home. Back in the village, they gathered at the base of the willow tree and offered sacrifices, giving tribute in appreciation for the protection they had received. Afterward, the Stone Villagers discussed the final and most important matter concerning that day's events. There was a need to eradicate Wolf Village. Otherwise, the news about the Stone Village possessing multiple ancestral weapons would spread, 
and they would all be endangered. The warriors equipped their weapons once the decision had been made, and their eyes shone with bloodlust. They were determined not to leave a single soul alive. Little Sher Howe would also join the fight. Grandpa Chief asked whether he was sure he wanted to go, and the little guy replied affirmatively. Sher Howe explained that he got everyone into trouble because of his indecisiveness and soft-hearted nature. Therefore, his decision had been made. Sometime later, Wolf Village had been set ablaze and dark, billowing smoke rose into the sky. As the rain fell on the mountain range, Shirling Hu encouraged the little guy to stay strong because he would not be a child forever. He explained that battle was what it meant to become a true warrior in the Great Wasteland. Sher Hao listened to his words as he stared at his blood-stained hand. The blood did not belong to him, but rather the enemy. He had helped slaughter everyone in Wolf Village. He replied to the captain that he understood every word he spoke. He said if he could not even get through that rite of passage, there was no way he could become a true warrior. If he couldn't get through the ordeal, how could he take back everything that belonged to him? With those final words, his expression turned fierce as he clenched his fist. As though bursting forth from the vast and barren wastelands, a blazing light erupted into the sky, illuminating the darkness and capturing the attention of all who beheld its grandeur. It was a sight unlike any other, a majestic flame that burned with an intensity so powerful that the very heavens appeared to be set ablaze. And then, amidst this awe-inspiring spectacle, a world-shattering cry rang out, echoing across the landscape and stirring the hearts of all who heard it. A tiny scarlet bird wielded a cloak of flames and soared through the air. Its sheer divinity was a force to be reckoned with. The world could not help but take notice of this breathtaking display. A formidable golden claw emerged from behind a thick blanket of clouds, and its magnitude shook the very earth below. With its unmatched power, it sought to capture the little scarlet bird. However, Little Red was not one to be caught so easily. It darted from side to side, moving with a speed its opponent could not match. The golden claw was frustrated by its inability to snatch its prey and slammed down on a nearby mountain ridge, causing devastation. Dust and debris filled the air as the onlookers in the distance watched in awe at the unparalleled force of the golden claw and the sheer determination of the little red bird. On that day, people recalled the ancient times when a godlike existence roamed the earth. The awesome power of that ferocious beast could turn the world upside down. Its might could engulf the world with just a blow. Humans are a powerless race in comparison. They could only prostrate themselves on the ground and tremble, hoping to be spared from calamity. Someone exclaimed about the awesome event that happened in the mountains. They wondered whether the war that started two years earlier had yet to end. After the battle with Wolf Village, a day and a night passed. From the depths of the wasteland, a monstrous flame burst out. The children stood with the village chief and discussed among themselves, wondering about the phenomenon's cause. They asked whether it had been Little Red's doing. Sure Howe claimed it had been the doing of the Little Red Bird he often chased around the village. Chief Sher Yun Feng took a moment to ponder. The skirmish in the distance had attracted the gods and beasts to scramble to that place. A villager said that the brawl was so great that it seemed like the gods had been fighting in the sky, and if they were not careful, their village could be wiped out at any moment. However, there seemed to be a translucent energy shield surrounding Stone Village. It protected them from the wild energy fluctuations and prevented them from clearly seeing what was happening outside. Sure how cheerfully suggested they go and catch Little Red, just like Suan Ni. Nee. Grandpa Chief found the little guy to be unbelievable. The little guy's words were pure nonsense, so he yelled at Sher Hao, asking if he was drunk on beast milk. Pihu commented that there were also milk stains on the corners of Sher Hao's mouth. Grandpa Chief continued chiding the milk baby, saying he did not know the sky's height and the earth's depths. Even though one could not see the whole picture, the kind of destructive power released from the distant clash not even the Suan Ni nee could compare. The great beast in the distance should be the most powerful in the entire wasteland. The children were astonished when they heard the chief's words. There were so many powerful beasts out there. They asked Grandpa Chief to tell them about the things outside in the great wasteland. They were overcome by curiosity and wanted to know how big the outside world was. The chief turned away and chuckled. He asked whether they wanted to hear about his trip to the wilderness when he was younger. However, he said there was no way he could tell it to them. His attempt to build suspense failed as the children turned away with disinterest. They seemed to have grown accustomed to the village chief's ramblings and monologues. Whenever the village chief spoke about such matters, they would find it most challenging to listen. 
Shi Yunfeng awkwardly called after them, realizing he was about to lose his audience. He finally dropped his droll narration style and complied with the request to tell the story straightforwardly. He said they had grown up and needed to know how big and dangerous the world was. He began narrating how he went out into the wilderness with dozens of friends from Stone Village. After traveling for 80,000 miles, he was the only one left alive. Grandpa Chief explained that the outside world was very big, and their current domain, which contained Stone Village's territory, was vast. The children seemed to be intrigued by the information and wondered when they would be able to venture out. The heavyset boy asked whether there would be enough food out there. The village chief explained that above the wasteland was a higher realm that could not be comprehended. Therefore, he emphasized the need for the children to study the bone scriptures very well. As he spoke, the milk baby drank from his gourd. Grandpa Chief realized that he had lost his audience. Because of the children's tender age, they had a very short attention span, especially when it involved matters requiring lengthy explanations. He was exasperated and asked why they did not know when to listen carefully when others spoke. In response to his outburst, they quickly regained their focus and began taking notes. Grandpa Chief said he really could not do anything about them, so he explained that mastering the bone scriptures was like owning a weapon, and to control that weapon, one must make themselves stronger. That was the root of cultivation. He then pointed to Shi Hao and recommended that he strengthen his body through physical exercise from that day onward for the sake of his future cultivation. A stronger body would also be able to withstand the medicine baths made using the blood essence of the Suan Ni. Shi Hao's friend was surprised and said the milk baby was already as strong as an ancient beast, yet he still needed to practice. Grandpa Chief explained that only by making the bone scriptures a part of oneself can the flesh and the bones be like the races favored by the heavens, blending and uniting with the heaven and the earth naturally. Otherwise, imitation was only imitation after all, and it wasn't easy to exert real power. Afterward, the milk baby began a strict training regimen. He had finished placing 100 boulders near the edge of a cliff when he realized he was not tired anymore. He remembered Grandpa Chief's instructions about letting the bone scriptures blend into the body and becoming one with every inch of flesh and blood in his body, refining the good fortune of heaven and earth, introducing the essence of the sun and the moon into the body, completely changing the body and spirit. This world had multiple cultivation stages, each ascending to a significantly higher realm than the previous. The different cultivation realms were the blood transformation realm, heavenly passage realm, spirit transformation realm, engravement realm, formation gathering realm, and the venerable realm. Shi Hao was still in the initial stage of cultivation, and there were still many realms for him to break through before he could stand at the pinnacle of power with the strongest among the human race. Some humans would produce holy bones, in that way, one's original engravings appeared, and one could possess their own exclusive and original treasure technique. Although the blood transformation stage was at the entry level, it was an extremely important foundation for cultivation. Fighting purebred primordial beast cubs with pure physical strength would be possible if one reached the extreme. Stone Village's territory remained very peaceful after the battle for the Suanese remains. There were no longer any fierce battles, which made people almost forget the thrilling event of that frightening day. In contrast, the far side of the wasteland was no longer peaceful. In the distance, flaming feathers drifted in the winds, and at a faraway place was the settlement of the Golden Wolf tribe. Several riders were rushing into the settlement on horse-like beasts. Their leader quickly announced the purpose of his arrival, to deliver a report. The man revealed that there was an urgent report and quickly bowed at the base of a towering pole upon which a hairy man sat. His appearance was wild, and his body was brimming with power. It was as though he was a lion in human form, especially because of the long golden mane. The warrior addressed the man as a clan lord and reported that they had been movements in the south, and there seemed to have been a powerful mountain treasure that had been born. The ancient warring remnants fighting for two years had yet to be wiped out. He speculated that a great holy object was about to be born. The clan lord had a savage glint in his eyes, whose pupils had become slits. He instructed the warrior to go and fetch the boys in the clan, take them out, and see the world. In the distance was a great lake as blue as the ocean. The land was endowed with beautiful scenery. Above the lake was a skyline dotted with islands like stars in the sky. In the lake's billowing waves were several children riding on water dragons. One of the dragons leaped from the water's surface into the rolling clouds. Its scales sparkled as it shot into the sky. Some adults supervised the children on the island before a grand palace. 
Among them was a man who spoke with an irritated expression, asking the children not to be rowdy because the adults would bring them along on a journey to the outside world to see what other geniuses were like in the outside world. An arrogant boy retorted, saying that the last time they met a formidable genius but quickly overpowered them. Their opponent would not have escaped if it weren't for their flaming unicorn. The boy's water dragon then ascended through the clouds amid his maniacal laughter. His name was Zhao Ping. Two other adults watched the exchange. Among them was a tall man who was the lord of the settlement. His expression turned into an evil grin when asked if he was concerned about the boy. The man chuckled and said the young man, Penger, was just too excited. A sovereign ruled another faraway country. A calm and dignified voice sounded from the magnificent throne in the imperial palace, while all before him knelt and kowtowed. The voice belonged to the sovereign, and his name was Zi Shan Hu. He asked whether the archaic descendants had fought for two years without backing off. His face was hidden, but his body radiated an aura akin to a purple sun. The energy was his incredibly dense life force flowing into the surroundings like an open furnace, giving him the appearance of a deity. A warrior knelt on the ground and dared not lift his head. He kowtowed and replied affirmatively, saying he suspected a world-shocking celestial object had appeared. The sovereign smiled at the intriguing report while his subjects' bodies trembled on the ground. In yet another distant location was another vast land ruled by its sovereign. Inside the huge, grand palace, thunderous rumblings could be heard. That was the sound of a man speaking. His terrifying voice shook the entire palace. The thunderous rumblings shook many armored soldiers in place. The sovereign was a burly man that resembled a lightning-powered Heihachi Mishima. His name was Lei Hu. Once he learned that his peers had made a move, he ordered his subject to fetch his younger brothers and head toward the Great Wasteland. He instructed them to beat up the geniuses of the Purple Mountain should they cross paths. The thunderous voice echoed throughout, and inside the throne hall several bolts of black lightning intertwined and wrapped themselves around an imposing silhouette. An ocean of thunder was forming in that direction. Elsewhere, a distant valley was surrounded by majestic mountains that reached the clouds. On the summit was a land adorned in heavy silvery snow that had accumulated from the freezing temperature. Despite that, a majestic city had been built in the middle of the huge mountain and overlooked everything in all directions. A elderly robed figure casually commented about the emergence of a holy object in the great wasteland. He found it inconceivable and speculated that his peers, the two rivaling sovereigns, Zi Shan Hu and Lei Hu, had planned a confrontation between their descendants. The elder instructed his attendants to bring the young geniuses outside the settlement to see the world. At that moment, two young girls suddenly appeared, addressed the old sovereign as their grandfather, and expressed their willingness to join the expedition to Stone Village. However, the man reprimanded them and said the journey to the wasteland was not a play date, but a trip to a dangerous place. In response, they promised that they would be obedient little girls. Their grandfather reluctantly agreed to the request and said they should go outside and see the strength of the world's geniuses. The vast wasteland was bustling with commotion. Suddenly there was a surge of wind and clouds, and heroes from all walks of life rushed toward Stone Village. The unrest within the depth of the desolate wasteland had spread far and wide, drawing the attention of a few great clans. These clans had dispatched their elites, and the strongest young geniuses had gathered. The gears of fate had begun to turn. In the mountains surrounding Stone Village, Sher Howe had almost completed his daily physical conditioning exercise, while the other kids cheered him on. Upon completion, he proudly flexed his tiny biceps. Even the adults marveled at the shredded milk baby. The village chief, Sher Yunfeng, nodded in approval and said he was ready for the true blood baptism with the swan knee's body, the precious scarlet horn of the fire ox, and the demonic ape's arm. Although the little guy had grown considerably stronger, he still could not help but shudder at the thought of soaking in the medicine bath. The process of harvesting the treasures had to be completed quickly. Otherwise, if they were left for too long, the powers of their blood essence would be greatly diminished. Therefore, Stone Village's warriors worked hard to harvest the remains of the great Suan Ni. Their tools frequently broke because of the archaic descendants' powerful physique. They carefully gathered the beast's blood, ensuring no drop was wasted. The little guy's medicine bath had been prepared. While he soaked in it, Grandpa Chief added the final ingredients to the steaming bath. Sher Hao wondered why he wasn't bathing in the treasure ingredients when he noticed the chief added venomous insects and beasts. Even his friends on the side thought the bath looked gross. Sher Yunfeng said the critters were the best medicinal ingredients. He then instructed the boy to take a deep breath and completely submerge himself in the bath. 
While he spoke, a mysterious object glowed in his hand. Sher Hao obeyed and held his breath under the surface. The great swan knee, the fire ox, and the demonic ape were all worthy of being the most powerful creatures among the primordial beasts. Their remains contained their vigorous power that rushed around the cauldron. Their essence remained unyielding, so the little guy needed to resist their violent energy physically and mentally. As Sher Hao endured the violent baptism, someone outside the cauldron expressed concern for the milk baby's well-being. Suddenly, a dense aura from the cauldron spread into the surroundings, and several circular patterns appeared, formed by mysterious glowing symbols. The intense energy fluctuations made the adults pray for the little guy's safe return from the baptism. A moment later, Sher Hao shot out of the cauldron like a rocket while yelping and clutching his backside, which appeared to have almost been done medium rare. He crashed to the ground several meters away while Shi Ling Hu, the vice captain and grandpa chief, gasped in shock. The little guy had jumped to a height of 20 meters. Shi Yunfeng felt pride in his heart because the little guy's insane jump meant the baptism had worked. The adults gathered to examine him, and when they got too close, he instinctively shoved one of them away. The tragic character was the vice captain. Even Shi Hao was shocked by how much strength he had used. His light push was slightly overpowered now. The man awkwardly scratched his head, saying he slipped and fell. Sher Hao's friends, however, did not underplay the situation. They knew he had become much stronger than they, yet again. Everyone knew that Sher Hao had been completely reborn. He beamed joyfully when he discovered his body brimming with seemingly inexhaustible strength. Afterward, Grandpa Chief handed him a treasure bone harvested from the skull of the Suan Ni. It was a miraculous find because the beast failed to destroy it before it died. While Sher Hao gazed at it with wonder, Grandpa Chief urged him to take his time comprehending its mysteries. The chief inwardly thanked the heavens for sending such a lucky little star. Under the nourishment of the Swan Knee's treasure body baptism, everyone had made unimaginable advancements and breakthroughs in their cultivation. Even Grandpa Chief went into seclusion, hoping to cure the unmentionable illness he had suffered for many years. Not only did the villagers soak in the beast's essence, but they also ate the Swan Knee's flesh. Pi Hu's father, Ching Ling Ying, who was seriously injured, also got a chance to break through his realm of cultivation while in retreat. While Stone Village was immersed in joy, people came from all directions and were also in high spirits. Atop the soaring water dragon, Zhao Peng, the arrogant brat, asked how much further they would still travel before they arrived at their destination. The man behind him calmly explained that their destination was not much farther. Just ahead was the place they would compete for the mountain treasures. It was almost time to stop, and they could not proceed rashly. When Stone Village came into view from the sky, Penger chuckled excitedly and leaped off the water dragon's back. His short frame plummeted toward the ground and landed with a loud crash. The boy gazed at the distant willow tree and commented in surprise about its charred state. He believed that the tree contained the treasure he sought. Zhao Peng's peculiar looks made it seem like the legendary water tribe had gone metal. He called his uncle and asked whether he should kill the guardian spirit. The man said Penger should retrieve it and bathe in its essence later on. He reminded the group that guardian spirits were not so easily disposed of. Suddenly a whistling sound resounded from the sky. It was made by a sharp flying bone cutting through the sky. Atop the bone was a group of people whose destination was Stone Village. The piercing sound startled Zhao Peng, making him protest against the interruption. The giant animal bone crashed into the ground while its passengers leaped away. The debris cleared to reveal a pair of feminine boots, whose owner casually repeated the warning from Zhao Peng's uncle. As she spoke, the giant bone shrunk with a flash of light and leaped into her palm.